Good. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Giuseppe Moscherini. I'm uh, very excited to have this uh, joint session of uh, the search and matching uh, workshop, in, workshop in macro and finance with uh, these three <coughs> old people, Guido, Philippe, and I, who organized the uh, Summer Institute uh, group. So what we thought we'd do is a session on just search theory, because we think that in this world of data and computers and stuff, theory still should play a role and it's important to give it space. And so actually the three of us organized a session in Princeton last year, which was mostly about search theory and this year we joined forces. So we have an exciting program with four talks. And let me just remind you that um, uh, the non-webinar, non-panelist participants should ask questions about Q&A. So let me thank uh, Zach and Shen Sheng for putting uh, this together doing most of the work uh, the three of us can attribute it just some food for thought and um, so you will ask questions mostly we'll ask questions through Q&A and we'll have I think five minutes at the end of each talk to ask general questions um, and open discussion and so with that said let me uh, leave the floor to Xu Yong who is presenting uh, the first paper well, thank you very much. Indeed, this is a new format. I have been to the Princeton one on advanced in search theory. So this is uh, kind of co-organized now with, uh, you know, the money and the finance group in search margins. So I think technology has advanced. Well, um, this is, uh, I don't know how to call it. It's search theory apparently, but there are some numbers to come afterwards. So if you, Suppose you take the new classical function, uh, production function with capital and uh, age. Here, the age is going to be interpreted as the scale of the worker. And you make it a differentiable, and let's say the cross pressure is positive. If, if the market, in this case, the labor market is, uh, I think a capital market too, in some way, but I'm going to focus on the labor market for obvious reasons. If sorting is frictionless, there's no matching friction between capital and scale, then Becker's paper, I mean, specialized to uh, transferable utilities would imply two important results. One is that the PAM, positive associative matching, is socially efficient. So, which means in this specific context, high skills should be working with more capital. <clears throat> The second result is that PEM is also an equilibrium because you allow you know, market price to function, then uh, the positive assortative matching would be basically outbeat uh, negative sorting in many ways. So it will end up to be equilibrium. These are really nice results and that's probably why Beck's, result, Beck's paper or papers are so um, popular. The only problem is that once you introduce matching frictions, <clears throat> PEM is not necessarily socially efficient. So this is uh, what I had done in this GED paper in 2001. And that's not, you know, usually you think, oh, my, you know, such outcomes or such equilibrium is not efficient or when the hostess, con hostess condition is violated. But that's not the case here because the, that paper has directed search. So, I mean, it automatically gives you the hostess condition. Despite that, a PEM is not necessarily socially efficient, constrained wise. And the central idea there, or trade off, is that uh, the social planner has to make a trade off between, you know, the increased output resulting from PEM versus basically the matching rate. You can insist on PEM, but then it takes a long time for people to meet and that's not necessarily a good idea if if uh, you know, complementarity is not strong enough and also is not a necessarily an equilibrium so i mean that's the paper by Sherman smith or i mean i mean the paper i did in jet also has a equilibrium part the equilibrium part is socially efficient of course since the social Social optimum is not necessarily PEM. The equilibrium is not necessarily PEM either. So in general, the literature seemed same to come to the conclusion that, okay, with margin frictions, what you need to get PEM 
to be socially efficient at equilibrium outcome is that you need strong complementarity. Yeah? If, if complementarity between K and H is strong enough, then the, the increased output from PAM is going to outweigh this consideration for matching, for matching speed. So then you're going to get basically back to uh, Becker's results. All right, what if we actually take a dynamic macro view of that problem? I mean, the notation seems to suggest it's a macro. Well, in that case, firms can invest to, to change the K over time. So, I mean, in contrast to um, a lot of papers in this sorting literature and also in macro labor, K should not be a fixed attribute in macro at least, because otherwise, I mean, all the neoclassical stuff would be, um, seems to have wasted the 1960s and 70s dealing with the dynamics. The whole idea is that, yeah, firms can accumulate the capital. Now, once you actually allow capital to be accumulated, here are the three obvious questions that can be asked. One, uh, can this post-match investment need to pay them eventually? Yeah now wrong outcome. The second thing is that how does that investment affect dynamic sorting? So here dynamic sorting really means dynamic in contrast to a lot of other uh, papers with the same phrase in, in the title of the paper. In those papers usually they don't allow firms to accumulate the capital. Dynamic sorting is just given the amount of frictions people you know, for example, workers switch, job, switch jobs from firm to firm and so on. That's what they call dynamic sorting. Here is actually, the other dimension is that actually K changes over time. And a third one is what, what would that imply for a lot of macro labor related questions like productivity profiles of workers, inequality and so on. So I think it's, uh, once you ask it, this question about investment, it really is, uh, is quite interesting. So yeah, I only have probably 40 or 38 minutes left. So uh, let me just tell you the main results. On the theoretical side, I mean, the final outcome is actually very simple. No matter what kind of stuff you have, the final, once you allow firms to accumulate the capital, the final assignment is always PEM. This is just a neoclassical outcome. And what is more interesting is that in the dynamics from short term to the final outcome, it just turns the head around of, the, of what we thought was right at the bottom of the first slide. Remember what I told you that given all these matching frictions, we tend to think that, okay, you just need the complementarity to be strong enough, you get a pair. Well, that's actually just the opposite if at least when they when you look at the short term. If you really push the complementarity to be very strong, let's think you're the social planner. You would say, okay, I'm going to be able to accumulate the capital anyway. Why should I insist the, uh, the, the margin to be PEM to start with? I should actually go NAM. I do all the investment later. I get these people hired as fast as possible. So strong complementarity actually need to, is more likely going to need to, you know, negative sorting initially. So, I mean, you put this initial negative sorting together with the final PAM, you can see it's going to imply that, uh, you know, labor productivity, you know, workers wage profile, they're going to have uh, uh, heterogeneous slopes. The high skills are going to have a much steeper slope. And Young, course, can I ask a question? Yep. Just to understand, um, why is there any, why is the, there would be any reason in this in this environment to uh, do any investment ex ante? In fact, to have any capital set up before meeting a worker. Ah, a very good question. Of course, I mean one line of answer, which I'm going to get to, is that the cost of vacancy is going to be the increase in function of the capital stock that you put in there in the first place. So you can't just, you know, you can, but it's 
it's cost me to have a lot of so capital. The question of what's the other way around? Why don't you start with nothing and do it later? Well, it's an optimal trade-off. So you would still have to have something. Um, I mean, okay, we're going to come to the production function and the cost function later. So on the quantitative side, uh, it's kind of a calibrated, a simple calibration. It shows that, uh, yeah, it's not just a theoretical uh, possibility. The initial sorting is actually inductive. And that implies that features three and four, the heterogeneous slope and the within scale, uh, scale inequality, they are actually significant. Okay, the literature I'm going to skip, but just that uh, th there is this uh, set of papers on um, you know, investment, but they are actually dealing with the pre-match investment, not post-match. So I'm actually looking at the post-match investment. Okay, the environment has uh, continuous time, infinite horizon, so the common discount rate is R. So we're going to look at a uh, fixed measure for workers, a union measure for workers, and these people are ex ante heterogeneous in scale H. Firms, they are the same. So here, for, again, the firms and jobs, there isn't really any distinction. So there's just a competitive entry that determines it. Firms are going to rent capital from you know, the outside of the world at this rental rate R. All right, a match between K and H. So remember K is capital, H is worker's skill. So I guess a, a job hires one worker. Net output is just output, which has this tilde on the top. That's a typical production function, minus the rental cost of capital. So this is the object that we're uh, going to look at. So it's a typical, uh, you know, monotonicity, concavity, and more importantly, uh, you know, complementarity between K and H. So if you really look at this uh, environment and say, okay, suppose there's no matching friction at all, the, what is the final you know, capital stock uh, working with a particular scale H? Well, that's just you know, equating the marginal prod productivity of the capital to the rental rate. That is the derivative of this F to K should be zero. And then you stop for the K star. I mean, complementarity is going to imply that uh, the K star is a strictly increasing function of H. There you get a positive sorting in the, in the final outcome. So that's what I said, the final outcome is actually very simple. Now, uh, just to finish the description of the environment on uh, these people, if a worker is unemployed, home production is assumed to be constant. You can make it depend on you know, increasing age as well, but that's really not going to change much because it's the interaction between age and K that matters. If someone is unemployed, there's no K. All right, so the question you asked earlier is really about this uh, cost function. So if a firm tries to, you know, create a vacancy, it has to choose what capital stock to start with. Yeah, I mean, that's the initial capital stock. Now, the cost of vacancy is going to be uh, increasing K. So that's clearly important. If you have this to be constant, it's just as what Guido said. I mean, um, well, you would just, just choose it, the capital stock is going to be jumping directly to whatever the level will be. Now for the quantitative part, I also would need the calibration part, I will also have convexity. So these two assumptions play different roles. The first one is really the one that's making the initial capital stock below the final one. The second one is going, it's going to be important quantitatively for whether you know, the initial matching is going to be known. But it's not going to be, it's not the one that's driving the initial capital stock I mean, quantitatively to be lower than the final one. 
Now, once the firm you know, Sorry, started with- Sorry, just to clarify, you said that phi prime prime strictly positive, that's what delivers NAM um, at, the, at the entry stage, right? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. I mean, okay, uh, to get, yeah, I mean, the short answer is yes. You do need this assumption. Can I briefly ask, if I, if I only had uh, to pay the rental rate of capital, would that be equivalent to saying there's a, a, a phi, a vacancy cost? I mean, do I have to pay the vacancy, do I have to pay the rental rate of capital if the job is not filled? That's what I'm asking. Would that be enough or do I need something else? No, this, this, uh, this C includes the rental cost. So you will see that, so it's this, this is why this assumption is actually not a very, the first one is not a very strong because the rental cost of capital is, is already an increase in function of a K. So, so that would give you, because, so that, that's what I tried to ask. So this, this, you don't model the rental cost of capital as long as the job is not filled. So this phi in some sense includes the rental cost of capital? Yes. Good. So the increasingness is really very right. weak. Yeah. Very okay. weak one. So the, if, if a firm actually, uh, you know, hired some worker successfully, successfully matched, then the firm can think about, okay, what to do with this capital stock and then can do some post-match investment high. So the capital stock is going to change over time by the amount you invest. Now, this is more like an adjustment cost. So, so the, the cost is increasing, marginal cost is positive and increasing. So just for convenience, that's because eventually, you know, you start with something, the capital below the final state that you're going to invest. So that's the one I'm going to focus on. Uh, in other case, the other side, I mean, given this perfectly certain environment, a social planner would never start, you know, capital above the final state. So there's no, you know, you know, negative investment uh, to talk about. It's not never going to happen. So for that reason, I'm going to assume that, you know, the negative part is not very interesting. That's the final assumption on the C. Okay, so investment in here is uh, perfectly reversible because if, if the firm says, okay, I'm done with this, I don't want to hire the worker anymore, uh, the firm simply returns the capital to whoever uh, they, uh, they rented the capital from. So it's not because of irreversibility of, of investment. It's just, it's important that this capital or investment is not perfectly transferable between jobs. You know, if you want to actually, that's here the interpretation is the simplest one that we actually use in many search matching models for labor. A job has one worker. But you, know, you think about a firm that probably have many jobs, then you have to think about how the firm actually moves capital from one job to another one. Okay, in this case, you still need to, if, if the other job it was vacant before, you still need to you know, incur this cost to create. Just because one job has a capital, you can't just costlessly move to the second job and then fill that one. You still need to go through the vacancy cost. Now, lots of people have a kind of uh, uh, mixed feelings about this K. I mean, I think it's not very smart uh, in some sense because they say, oh, well, I got hired, I, you know, I got some capital stock. What do you mean by investment over time? Does the firm give me a bigger computer over time? Yeah, if you want to actually think in that way, that's, that's fine, but I think that's a very, bad interpretation because broadly, when you think about what we do or many organized firms do, uh, once they find, you know, worker um, with a high skill, I guess in some sense, what is really driving the difference between different workers is really just, you know, the size of, let's say the, the size of the projects they manage. And with those uh, projects, different sizes of projects come with a different capital. 
So it's not necessarily the personal stuff you directly work with, like a computer you have. It's really these things the firms are doing. That you started with, they give you, they give you a very small thing to, to work with. I mean, tiny project to work with. Uh, anyway, this is what I said. The broader interpretation of K is really just these other things, um, which are costly for the firm. All right, search is directed, and that's usually, uh, uh, that's modeled in the usual way. So here, I don't have on the job search. On the job search is interesting. It's just, it's actually quite much more difficult than the current one I'm writing up. So only unemployed workers can search. So it's useful to think about uh, sub-market as these three things. It's indexed by H, the worker's skill, because skill is perfectly observable and uh, in some sense contractible. And the other two objects, Y is the initial capital stock that the firm would have for this H. The second one is P, that's the matching rate for this worker. So phi and P are the two characteristics of this sub-market targeting skill wage workers. So the, given any matching rate P, the tightness can be uh, you know, computed once you specify a matching function, then the tightness is going to be, um, with the constant returns to scale matching function, that's going to be just a function of P. So I'm going to... Young, should I be surprised that there is no wage in the definition of a sub-market? Oh, so far I'm going to describe the social finance problem first. And after I have done this, I will, if I have time, I will briefly do the equilibrium. Right now it's just the social finance problem. The social planner says, oh, your H type, this is the sub-market you're going to go to with a phi and p. So, so this uh, tightness function, once you assume that the matching function has the usual properties of you know, uh, strictly positive marginal productivity and concavity, then the theta function is going to be increasing and strictly convex. All right, so a match separates the exogenous at yeah, this rate delta. That's really, uh, as I said, there's no on a job search here. Okay, the planner is trying to think about uh, what sub-market to send this H and um, unemployed workers with a skill H2. So that's the planner's choice, P and a phi. P is the matching rate and a phi is the initial capital stock. So this is the planner's problem can be decomposed into these two stages. Yeah. One is what's the initial match I should, what's the initial sub-market I should send these people to search. And the second one is after that matched, how, do, how should I choose the investment profile? So the first one is this uh, matching problem. And uh, VH is the value function of uh, an unemployed worker with a skill age. Um, the first one is home production. What's the city inside? That's the expected uh, sep social surplus. V is the joint surplus, joint value of a match. It's not the worker's value or the firm's value. So just look at the equation for V. You, you see, if the worker is going to search in this sub-market, the matching rate is P, and the match is going to destroy the value of unemployment and it creates this value of match. So V minus VU is the surplus of the match. But in order to actually create those sub-markets, uh, the, the planner has to incur the cost, the vacancy cost that depends on this initial capital stock. Yeah. And the match, I mean, this is just the, the cost of vacancies per worker. So that's why you need to multiply by the tightness. All right. The second problem is, okay, the worker is matched. Then the, firm, the planner says, okay, what's the optimal trajectory of investment? That's actually quite simple. It's just going to match, going to maximize what you can get by increasing the capital stock. 
if you if the partner invests I, that's going to change the capital stock. Remember, DKDT is equal to I. But then there's this adjustment cost, C of I. All right. So th there are propositions in the paper, and there are conditions to guarantee that the the solution is unique, quite kind of complicated conditions. But I'm just going to show you in graph what it implies. Oh, first of all, existence uniqueness can you know can be specified with the conditions in general, but dynamics would involve. Um, I mean complicated stuff. So there's no progress to be made uh, unless I actually linearize. Yeah. So to get dynamics, I actually linearize that the social planners uh, often valid conditions. So here, this graph on the horizontal axis is the capital stock and the vertical axis is the investment. So think about a worker with H1 scale. So they, they the DIDT equal to zero, that's this uh, kind of negatively slope line. And DK DT equal to zero is actually, sorry, yeah, DK DT equal to zero is just I equal to zero. So it's just the horizontal axis. So the intersection between these two would be the long run outcome, what I call the final stage. And that was, the capital stock there is the K star, I told you, I think in slide three or whatever. So that's the neoclassical outcome that sets the marginal productivity of capital to the rental rate of capital. This red thing, that's the, that's the stable saddle path leading to the steady state. Suppose you compare two skill levels, H1 and H2, H2 is higher than H1, we already said that you know the final outcome of K has to be higher for H2 than H1. So the final you know matching outcome is is pain. So the saddle path needing to that one is this dash the red thing. Now where does where does the uh, assignment start with? Well, I drew one scenario here, I mean, it's, which is the interesting one I'm going to explain. So for the no scale, the capital stock is going to be in the horizontal, uh, the level on the horizontal axis corresponding to point A1. And for the high scale is A2. So you can see that A2 is on the left of A1. So the initial capital stock is lower for the high scale for a low scale. So you get actually negative sorting initially. But then eventually the, the A2 has to go to a higher K and then the A1. So eventually this is going to be reversed. Okay, so this is the one possibility that I'm enjoying. So what are the conditions? So uh, Shriyong, can, I, can I quickly yep. ask, can you clarify what this K star is? I mean, you refer to the rental rate. This is a planner problem. There's no rental rate. There is. Also, there was a case where there was no adjustment costs with the rental no, rate. No, the rental rate, the planner is for this, uh, I mean, if you want to take the, it's a small open economy. The planner is doing the planning problem for the small open economy. It's still facing the same <laughs> rental rate as the market. But there was no rental rate in the, pro I mean, there's the R. But is that obvious that? No, here, it is the rental rate, here. The, the social, the outcome in the final state is just to set the derivative of this net output. Right, function. but there's a little bit of, I mean, there's a rental rate model in, in macro where you rent the capital, and then there's a owner problem where you buy the capital at adjustment cost. And the, frankly, the planet problem is mixing the two, so I'm not sure. So if you can rent as much capital as you want, now there's an, an adjustment cost on investment, uh, that's not, so if you want to rent more capital, you have to pay the adjustment cost, I guess. Yeah, so but the right. prime of zeros will be zero, so in the- I know, but that doesn't mean that the, opt the steady state is necessarily the, the, the classical will, because one. Because at the steady state, I, do, I will be zero. Yeah. So it the has, no, but, will be just R. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay, so I guess uh, this may clarify because 
I mean, this is the assumption. They say prime i is zero if i is zero. That that would be, I think, partly related to what you are trying to get to. I understand. But, uh, yeah, that should be shown. It's not yeah, anyway. Okay, so this is the one scenario. So I have to say, uh, I mean, when that could happen. Okay, so this capital I, that's the that's the policy function for optimal investment, which would depend on the capital stock and the worker's skill. When the capital stock is the initial one, which is a phi, uh, this would be the initial investment. It's the amount of investment right after the match is formed. So, okay, just for you know discussion purposes, let's say, okay, let's, let's just take that I level as given, the initial investment as given, and I say what the matching pattern, pattern will be for the social and uh, the social plan's, planners decision. It can be nicely graphed with this thing. So what is uh, graphed here is the cross partial of the uh, data output function. I mean, discounted in some ways. There was a rental rate. There was a you know separation rate and there was this beta that's actually depending on the concavity of, of F and the convexity of the C. So just imagine that the F, the, this cross partial is really close to zero. So you've got some complementarity, but very weak. Well, this is what I said earlier. If you've got a very weak uh, complementarity, what the social planner says, if I actually have insist on paying me initially, these high age people are going to wait for quite a while in order to be matched and I don't gain much, much from this complementarity. So why don't I just do that? Get these high age people matched very quickly. So I'm going to do some investment later. So you get them, which is the phi prime to be negative, P prime, remember P is the matching rate for the worker. P prime being positive means that high skilled people are getting matched more quickly. So this is a case one. Then you can just increase this complementarity. And uh, if complementarity is really, really strong, you always get a you know pen because now the trade-off between the two is just exactly switched. You, the social planner should insist on pen because the amount of increase in output is enormous. Uh, it's worthwhile for them, for the high skill people to wait. And then you also get something in between, which I think a lot of people think is the normal outcome, which is that the highest skill people are matched more quickly, P prime is positive, and also they get a higher capital stock to start with. So this graph actually, it's what I depicted here and also the interpretation for the intuition. That's just a very similar to my uh, JET paper or the paper by Akut and Kyukyo. Young, could you have done the same picture moving, uh, I guess, uh, C prime prime, the convexity of the adjustment cost? Uh, no, the C prime prime doesn't really do much. You just imagine the C prime prime is just how fast I'm going to uh, twist the arms around to invest to get to the final state. It's actually the that the vacancy cost the function is the one that's going to be important. Um, I think you was probably Wait, if there that, is no adjustment cost, say that uh, sees. Uh, the cost of adding capital is just the rental rate of the extra capital. Um, wouldn't you, going back to earlier discussion, wouldn't you just match initially workers with zero and then instantaneously upon meeting adjust the capital to K star? No, why do you start with a zero? You will start with some capital stock here. Not if there is no adjustment cost. The only reason to start with something positive is for the adjustment cost, to save on adjustments, it seems. Well, it seems to be opposite. If there's no adjustment cost. Um, anyway, so I don't really think, you know, that, so C prime prime being positive is necessary for the, for the I to be positive. 
of course, because um, I mean, otherwise the, the adjustment would follow a, a one-step jump function. Um, but you know what determines the initial capital stock to be lower than the final one? That's actually this vacancy cost function, the the C prime being positive, which I mean is very natural because it includes uh, the rental cost. So, okay, that's just, Shujang, yep. can I ask you one thing about this? Your so so one thing is that the initial assignment can be num, right? Um, which I understand, but you had said initially that surprisingly it becomes more num when the cross partial goes up. Have ah, we seen that already? Is, yeah, it's coming. So okay, thank you. because this graph is certainly it's a it's a heuristic. Uh, argument because I'm actually, uh, you know, given the initial investment, this is the graph. But in this model, the initial investment in itself is actually endogenous. So let's just look at what if this investment is is higher. So suppose the initial investment is higher than the previous level, but still lower than some other level. Then suddenly you don't have the last case. The last case in this graph, in the previous graph, is that you have, you know, strong PAM initially, and the high skill people are actually being matched more slowly. Uh, once you actually get the initial inv uh, investment to be higher, the last one would have never occur because it's really costly to insist on strong PAM because you know we can still get to PAM very quickly by investment. So let's just push this argument a little bit more. What if the initial investment is even higher? You only got one case left, which is uh, NAM initially, and high school people are actually getting matched more quickly. So this is uh, the answer to, um, to Philippe's question. If the, if the uh, complementarity is very strong, Initial investment is more likely going to satisfy this condition. The initial investment will be very high. And if the in initial investment will be very high, this is the only graph you're looking at. So that's what I said. It's a sufficiently strong complementarity is going to induce this to be the only outcome, which is NAMI initially. Just to so go if, back quickly to what Guido said, I mean, this investment is high depending on what adjustment costs are. I mean, the adjustment yeah. costs have to be in this condition somewhere. This A2 yeah. and A1 must include C somehow. It's the, I think the beta actually has to do with the convexity the yeah. of the C right. function. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, the beta is that uh, double derivative. It actually involves F double prime, uh, that you know, C, the Greek C double prime and the Roman C double prime. So the question is, is there any way to state these conditions in terms of primitives or I guess not? This beta is, in, it's uh, the, the reason that it... Um, I mean, investment is not a primitive. That's what I'm saying. You, you state all this in terms of initial investment, which is... No, 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 no. No, I mean, just as anything that I told you, if you, if you, uh, if you need a rise, this is evaluated at the steady state. The beta is evaluated at a steady state. So it, it's depending, of course, on a lot of other. No, problems. no, I understand. But the I of phi h h, the I function is, is an investment function. It's an endogenous object. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So that stuff is, it's, <laughs> yeah. what I'm saying is that if you push F1 to, to be high enough, the, the capital I function will be greater than this cut of A2. So in terms of, you know, macro neighbor or the... Uh, uh, Can I still ask one thing, Shoyong? Is that because the F12 is so strong or just because that implies somehow that the level F at some point becomes so important? Uh, level F? No, it's the and cross pressure, yeah. I mean, the level of H shouldn't matter that much. Can I try to reformulate Philip's question? Imagine that uh, uh, there were like productivity level 
you know, TFP differences across worker types. Mm -hmm. um, that has nothing to do with the complementarity of capital and labor, but it would still imply large differences in the targeted uh, levels of capital. Philip's guess is as long as you have the big difference, uh, you're going to have a palm initially. And it's okay, nothing so, to do with the complementarity. That's no, my I mean, uh, okay, part of that is certainly the, the TFP matters because they show up in this uh, cutoff level A2. They actually is the, is the, is the marginal productivity that would show up in all this cutoff. I didn't actually show you what the expression for these cutoffs, but they do depend on, I mean, it's just like in these two papers I just said, the cutoff would, um, so for example, the cutoff for this one here and this one here, they all depend on the, actually both F1 and F2 and the, the marginal productivity of capital and, and, um, and scale. So, so the short answer is that it does matter, but it's matter, you know, in determining how you compare the initial uh, investment with this kind of levels. But I think, yeah, they, I mean, I don't know what kind of example of production function you can create so that you can separate these two. Certainly not with the Cobb Douglas. With the Cobb Douglas, the F12 depends on the, you know, TFP, so is the marginal productivity levels. I'm just kind of, because in usual conditions, I'm just, I guess I'm surprised because usually kind of levels and first derivatives of F also show up, right? If you, if you formulate something in log supermodularity, it's not just a cross partial that's kind of involved in it. Yeah, that's what so I'm, I'm trying to see it, where in these expressions I see that. It shows up in A2. So I don't know whether I have those expressions. They, so this cutoff, um, okay. Oh, sorry, so, sorry to interrupt, uh, you have five minutes. Yeah, five minutes. So I already answered that it does depend on the, the marginal productivity because it, the cutoff levels depend on it. So there is an equilibrium. In the equilibrium, it's as great as that. Okay, the sub-market now actually has to be you know, specified in terms of not just phi H, but also the offer, which is the discounted sum of present values X. Anyway, you can, you can implement it. So now let's just briefly put some numbers into this. Um, so the critical uh, parameters are these cost function parameters. There's a coverage parameter for the vacancy cost and there's a scale parameter for it. And the C is, uh, the C function is going to assume it to be a quadratic. So it's just the scale parameter that's going to be identified. So I'm actually just matching three unemployment rates, actually minimizing the distance between the three unemployment rates in the model with respect to, I guess, data. So these are taking us basically three level um, education levels, and these are the unemployment rates. So if I talk about wages, and then I'm talking about equilibrium, I need some bargaining power, that's just going to be hard. Okay, first, let me show you the uh, assignment. So on a whole, I know this is terribly small. When I put the EPS uh, graphs into the slides, they always end up to be small. The horizontal axis is the H. So the HL is 0.4 and the HH, the highest one is one. And so the red, that's the initial assignment of capital that's decreasing. So indeed with this kind of calibrated stuff, you do get negative sorting initially. The, the blue one, that's, that's P, that's the matching rate as a function of scale, that's increasing. So you, you've got basically, yeah, case one is the only one that's coming out of this model with these numbers. So the, the uh, capital assignment is going to have all these different slopes, yeah, because this is a graph where the horizontal axis is, uh, what is happening? It's time, actually, time in terms of months after the initial assignment. The vertical one is the capital level associated with, uh, I picked up uh, you know, three levels of the skills, the lowest and the medium and the highest. 
So the blue one is the highest, and the pink one is sorry, the pink one is the highest scale, the blue one is the lowest scale. Notice that, that the blue one starts above the pink one. So that's because of the initial negative sorting. But it's going to be very quickly, you know, reverse. So even though, I mean, it takes a very short time to reverse, it does have significant implications on you know, all these income profiles we're talking about. So let's just show you just the, the basically the wage coming out of the decentralized equilibrium of this uh, efficient allocation. So again, it's, uh, the horizontal axis is the time after the uh, uh, match, and the vertical one is this wage levels for the three uh, scale levels. The pink one is the highest skill. The blue one is the lowest skill. Because skill itself is more productive, so you don't get crossing. You just get, you know, this stuff being modified. If you take the neoclassical one, the, the pink one will be high up there and then basically much higher. Anyway, the high skill is having a, you know, basically high slope of wage rates over time than a blue one. So this is, I guess, some people call this the heterogeneous income process. But here it's just because of margin frictions and it comes from money. Okay, so do I have- And because one? of the wage function you assumed, right? The yeah, wage I didn't understand that, Fion. You said something strange. Uh, you said bargaining share in yeah. the direct search model. Yeah, because this uh, here, it's because uh, if you do the decentralization, I mean, what's, we know what's determined is just the present value. The wage profile can be arbitrary. So in order to determine the wage level, I have to say how they actually, uh, you know that, you should know this better. Yeah, yeah, but wouldn't the market then pin down that bargaining share, so to speak? No, no, no. It, it, the, I mean, what's pinned down is just the value. But yeah. how do you actually get a profile of wages to deliver that value? That's arbitrary if, if you don't have any bargaining. But uh, anyway, that, yeah. I'm, I also didn't get it, but maybe we don't have the time to sort it out now. Yeah, bargaining is determining the specific wage paths to implement that value. Yeah, but bargaining is also gonna pin down the present value, which is already pinned down by the, um, competition in yeah, the- Yeah, that's what you're saying. The, the direct search is going to give you X, and then what is bargained is to determine the initial way, well, basically the entire wage, the unique wage path that's going to uh, give this X. Of course, the, the constraint is the initial value is equal to the X. Can't you just split the output? I would have understood that. And yeah, you can do that too. Yeah. I mean, any kind of a monotonic uh, sharing rule would actually give you that. So, so okay. So all this says. What about we have like uh, three minutes for maybe? Do you want to? Uh, uh, you know, there is a question from way in the audience. Yeah, I, I have two slides. I, uh -huh. I need to go okay. through. So, yeah, right. so in terms of uh, average outcome, if you take the mean, the mean is actually uh, positively uh, positive sorting. So, but that doesn't mean that the friction uh, frictions are not important. So frictions are actually important. So the one way to measure this is what I call a frictional gap. If you take the expected value of of whatever the z, which can be net output or wages conditional on, on particular uh, scale, and then divide by the long run one, which is the neoclassical one. Uh, so that would be the gap. Well, for, for the net output, this is significant. That means the friction is driving on average about 18% difference from the, uh, from the neoclassical outcome. Well, it also implies large variations in, in within scale, you know, stuff like net output or wages. So here I'm plotting the uh, coefficient of variation in wages. This is all within a scale, so control for the scale. So what 
getting probably again around you know 16 percent uh, coefficient of variation well in terms of uh, output is a little bit higher uh, if you look at you know these other measures like a Mimi ratio that's it's gigantic I mean, Mimi ratio in wages, that's the uh, red one here, is around 1.8. Sorry, yeah, it is 1.8. So it's quite large. Okay, so these are the two slides um, that I want to give. All right. So, Wei, I, I mentioned you, do, do you want to ask your question? Okay, thanks, Chen Um Thanks, Shoyo. Um, I just have a quick question. If I try to reduce the interest rate pushing down R, so how do I think about capital accumulation and the effect on wage dispersion? Is if you reduce, reduce R, reduce R. Uh, that's a, actually a good question. So I haven't thought about how uh, you know reducing the interest rate would change things. But I guess here, yeah, if you reduce the the interest rate, it would have. Uh, uh, two effects, yeah, because one is that uh, the, the uh, interest rate is also the common discount rate. So you're making the planner and the economy more patient. If they are more patient, I, I think you are going to increase the uh, investment later on because the initial assignment is, is not that of very important. The value that's going to come afterwards is discounted at a lower rate. So you're going to have an even stronger possibility for negative sorting initially. Of course, the other thing is that it also reduces the cost of capital. So I don't know how these two forces would balance out. So it's not monotone somehow. I have no idea how they balance out because, okay. yes, yeah, I said uh, they play in opposite directions. Okay, thank you. So we, we're running short of time, so Shoyong, there is another question on the Q and A. Maybe you can uh, type your answer to him uh, to 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 to, yeah, to the attendees. So All right. we need to move on to the uh, next talk. Uh, our next talk is by Ron Waldhoff, and it's on search screening and sorting. And let me share my screen. Um, meanwhile, thanks for inviting us. Um, does this work? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is joint work with uh, Peter and Xiaoming, who are uh, on the call for all your difficult questions. Um, some of you have seen this, this work before. We have some new results there at the very end, so I hope I can get to that. So in the beginning, I'm gonna to try to be a little bit quick, but feel free to, to slow me down if you have any, any questions. Um, so what do we try to do? Another paper on sorting, we wanna understand if you have heterogeneous workers and firms, who is gonna match with, with whom? And uh, as Xu Yong, uh, already described, there is a large literature on that. Um, but where we deviate is in, in how we think about the, 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 the matching process. Most of the literature assumes that uh, uh, meetings between workers and firms are going to be bilateral, right? A firm meets a single worker and then decides whether to offer the job to that worker or to go back to the market to search for a new one. Okay, and if you look at how recruiting is done in Ron, reality, Ron, seems your slides. Um, there's something wrong with your slides. Oh, yeah, yeah. See it. doesn't work. Yeah, we see black okay. window. So let me, let me try to reshare. Uh, I don't know what happened. Um, Initially, we can see it, but are they back? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, so if you think about how we recruit in reality, I think that that's quite different from what we see in the literature, right? Typically firms try to collect a pool of applicants first, then maybe they're gonna interview a subset of that, and then they're gonna spend a lot of time comparing these workers against each other and try to figure out 
who is the best. Okay, and so that's what we try to, to take more seriously here. And, and of course the crucial question is like, okay, does that matter, right? Like we all know models are wrong, uh, but we're gonna argue that actually getting this right, this dimension matters quite a bit for, for the conclusions that we, we get, right? And, and perhaps surprisingly, we are gonna find that the easier it is for firms to screen, right? Like the easier it is to compare applicants, multiple applicants against each other, the harder it is to get sorting in our environment, okay? And, and that might be surprising now, but hopefully by the end of the talk, I'll, I'll have convinced you that this makes sense. Okay, so what do we do? We present a new model of labor market sorting. It's gonna be very general along various dimensions, uh, in particular, the degree of screening. And then we are gonna show that the sorting patterns in our environment depend on a comparison between two things. First, how much complementarity there is in the production function. Okay, that's what Xiong also discussed, right? that, that cross partial. Uh, but then on the other hand also, what we call a quality quantity elasticity, which is gonna be de determined by the search process. Okay, and, and, and whether we get positive or negative sorting is basically gonna depend on which of these two is bigger. Okay, and then we show that, that, that quality quantity elasticity is increasing in the degree of screening. And so that gives us then that as screening becomes easier, that elasticity goes up. And so we need more complementarity to, to overcome that effect if we want to get positive sorting. Okay. And yeah, like I said, in, in, in the presentation, I'm gonna focus on positive sorting, positive assortative matching, high type workers are matched with high type firms. When do we get that? There is a lot more in the paper. Uh, we describe conditions for negative sorting. We, we don't only look at matches, but also at applicant pools. When do better firms attract better pools of applicants? Uh, we allow for some signals, we endogenize screening and so on, okay? And if, if I get to that, I can talk about that a little bit, um, but, but for the most part, I'm gonna talk about positive assortative matching in the baseline model. Okay. I'm gonna skip the literature and then let's go, unless there's questions, let's go to the environment. Okay. So we have a static model with risk neutral firms and workers, okay? usual assumption that you know, firms are basically jobs, okay? So there's unit supply and demand of, of indivisible labor. Um, the measure of firms, we normalize that to one and firms are gonna be heterogeneous in, in their productivity Y, okay? Which is gonna follow some distribution J uh, on some uh, interval, Y lower bar to Y upper bar. Yeah? Then on the worker side, we're gonna have two types of workers, low types and high types, okay? And they're heterogeneous in X, okay? Uh, where X, again, is, is, is in, a, in a certain interval. And so we have XI, X1, low types, and X2, low, high types. And there is a particular exogenous measure of, of either, okay? Which we denote by lambda I. And so, the endowment of agents right, in this economy is described by this tuple here, right? It's, it's the productivity levels of the workers, their measures and the distribution of firms. Okay, and that's gonna be important because in the end we're gonna derive sorting conditions that are gonna hold for, for any endowment of agents. Now, this is a model of directed search Okay, so each firm is gonna post a wage menu, okay, W1, W2, where W1 is the wage that they're gonna to pay to a low type if they end up hiring one, and W2 is the wage that they're gonna to pay to a high type. Okay. Workers observe all these wage menus and then are gonna choose the one that maximizes their expected payoff, okay, and they direct their search to that one, where again, like the usual assumption applies, like we, we are gonna assume that they can't coordinate in this large market, so workers must use symmetric strategies, which gives us the, the coordination frictions. You're, you're all familiar with. 
Okay, and so all agents, all workers and firms that choose a particular wage menu, they're going to form a submarket. Okay, now within a submarket, we are going to have a particular. I have a, micro I have a quick question for you. Yeah. Could the menu um, depend on how many workers show up? No. How many in the pool? I mean, I can't, but maybe it should. No. So, so I mean. Um, we, we can actually show that like, this is without loss of generality, or right, this gives us efficiency already. So you can allow for a, a wider mechanism space. Firms are not going to be able to do better than this. Okay, so for the sake of the presentation, I'm just going to restrict attention to these wage menus. But if you give them a, a broader mechanism set, they're going to choose something that is payoff equivalent. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Okay, so let me then describe the, the, the micro foundation within the sub market that we're going to use. Okay, so within a sub market, we have workers and firms. And first, let's denote the, the queue lengths. Okay, we're going to have two types of queue lengths here. There's going to be the total queue length, which is the, the ratio of workers to firms. Okay, we're going to denote that by lambda. Okay, as a function of that wage menu. And then we have mu, which is the ratio of high type workers to firms. Okay. And so, so mu, no, sorry, lambda minus mu is the Q length of, of low type workers. Okay. But rather than having a, you know, a lambda one and lambda two, this is the way we set things up. Okay. So we have the total Q length and the Q of high types. Okay. Now, for the micro foundation, let's imagine that these firms and workers are positioned along a circle. Okay. And so here you see the, the orange you know, agents, their workers, the blue ones, their, their firms. Okay. Then how do applications and interviews take place? Okay. And remember, this is all within a particular submarket. We're going to assume that workers are going to walk clockwise to the nearest firm. That's going to imply that the number of applicants at each firm is going to follow a geometric distribution with mean equal to the total queue length. Okay. And at this point, firms don't know yet whether these workers are low or high types, right? That's why they appear all identical. Okay. How do they learn the types? Well, they can interview these workers, okay? But they cannot necessarily interview all of them. There's time constraints. Um, the dean only approves funding for three flyouts, okay? So we are gonna assume that the potential number of interviews follows another geometric distribution where the parameter is, is sigma, okay? And one way to microfound that is that basically there is a, there is a constant termination probability. Uh, you, you, you talk to this guy first, and then there's certain probability you can interview the next one. But, but I mean, this, this has a little bit of a, this sounds sequential, in, in, this is all gonna happen in zero time, right? Like the, there's, there's no decision to be made between one interview and the next. We just specify that the number of interviews that a firm can do follows this geometric distribution. Is it okay to think of it as happening sequentially with zero cost of an extra interview? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so there's never a reason to stop, basically. Um, now, the number of interviews, right, might be constrained by the number of applicants that you have. Okay, so the actual number of interviews is going to be the minimum of the number of applicants and the number of interviews. Okay. Initially, firms have no information, okay? So if they have seven applicants, they can interview three of them. They're just gonna pick three at random from the pool of applicants, okay? We can relax that a little bit. We do that at the end of the paper where we give some noisy signal about applicant type. Uh, but for now, let's just assume you don't know anything, you just pick three, okay? And then the interview reveals the, the true type of, of the worker, okay, with certainty. Okay, and so here you have high type workers, these green ones here, and you have low type workers, the red ones. Okay. 
then matching is after these interviews have taken place, matching is going to take place. And so we assume that only interviewed workers can be hired. You can rationalize that by saying like there's a very small probability that any worker is, is so terrible that they would give you a very large negative payoff. So you don't, right? Like we don't tend to hire assistant professors without, you know, having talked to them or having had them over for, for a campus visit. Um, and you can show that in equilibrium, right? This is not completely obvious, but, but in equilibrium turns out firms are gonna prioritize high types. Okay, so you, you prefer high types over low types, even if you have to pay them more. The wages are gonna be such that the profits you get from a high type are always gonna, right? So that's what I show here. So firms that have at least one high type among the interviewees are gonna match with one. This firm only had low types, so it's gonna hire a low type worker. Um, and um, yeah, that's it. And so you can see that like, if this firm had done more interviews, it could have been that this last worker here had been a high type, but you know, the, the, the frictions prevent the firm from, from discovering that. Okay, and an output, there's gonna be a standard production function, f of x and y, right, which is strictly positive, strictly increasing, and twice differential. Okay. The equilibrium definition, standard directed search, so let me skip that. Okay, now what do we get? We first show that, uh, and, and perhaps this isn't terribly surprising, so I'm gonna, not gonna spend too much time on this. Right? There's gonna be unique equilibrium. The equilibrium is constrained efficient. As I just mentioned, firms are gonna optimally choose to give priority to high types in hiring, right? Which as they should to get an efficient outcome. And if you rewrite the firm's problem in the usual way where you substitute the market utility constraint into the objective function, right, you can show that the firm's problem is equivalent to this, right? Where S is the amount of surplus created by a firm of type Y attracting Q's M and Lambda. And this, right, what we subtract from that is basically the cost of attracting those Q's, right? If you want to attract a worker, you better give him at least the market utility of a low type. If you want to attract a high type worker, you need to give him a little bit extra. You need to give him actually the, the market utility of a high type. Okay, and so from this formulation, right, you can see, right, like the firm's problem is basically equivalent to, you know, the one in a, in a competitive market for Q, so price is equal to the market utility. So that gives us the efficiency result, right? This is um, fairly standard. Ronald, uh, yeah. just a clarifying question. So far, what's different relative to the Scheimer JP? So, so yeah. Scheimer is a special case where you, can rank all workers perfectly. So I think see. of okay. that as the case where sigma is equal to one. Got it. Right? So this wouldn't happen. You would always interview all workers. And so in, in some sense, and so if sigma is zero, right? We have the other extreme, you only ever interview one worker and we are basically in the Eichhout Kircher world, right? So in some sense, we convexify the, uh, but, but the advantage of that is we can actually do comparative statics with respect to, to sigma, right? So rather than just having one, you know, information structure, we can actually change the information structure. Does that, yeah. Um, but yeah, indeed in Scheimer, there's also this efficiency result. And so in some sense, right, like we extend that to, to the, the whole uh, range. Okay. Um, Mark, uh, can I yeah. just a quick question? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this type self-selecting and what is preventing the self-selection, what you need to go through the screening. Um, so I'm sure this is wrong, but suppose a firm committed to offer a wage only for the high types mm -hmm. and not to the low types. And now given the sigma is less than one, there's a risk you attract the wrong types. And so there may be an advantage to attract only the good types and say, I'm just gonna hire the good types and post them. No, so, so, um, so, 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 
it's, then they would self select and no bad ties would show up there. Right. So if so, you're gonna if you're gonna set W one equal to zero, mm -hmm. you know for sure that you're only gonna attract high types. Right. So it was not that a deviation, a profitable deviation for some parameter values? Uh, from so I mean, uh, obviously there's no cost of you know of interviewing here, which I think would right. make the model you know the efficiency result probably go away. But even here, there's a risk you you can't interview the right people. So um, right. So so but if you want if you're if you're really keen, if you really want to make sure that only high types show up, then you're going to put W1 equal to zero. Right. Why don't some there, first do there that? Is, there is a potential downside to that, which I will explain in two slides. Sure. No, I understand the downside, but why isn't that possible, a possible equilibrium outcome for some parameter bodies? No, uh, it is. It is. Okay. And, and so we know from Philip's work, if sigma is very small, that will actually, some firms will decide to only attract high type work. Let me, right. I, I have a slide on exactly this, like, like in two or three slides from now. I think that will answer your question. Um, but before I go there, let me just show you this first, because this is, this is key step in our analysis, which makes everything work basically. I, you can derive, um, given the, the micro foundation of the matching process that I've shown to you, you can derive the following object. The probability that a firm with certain cues hires a high type worker. Okay. It turns out, right, let's call that phi of mu and lambda, that it has this structure here. Okay. You can let me go here, right? If you set sigma is equal to zero or sigma is equal to one, you can actually you get special cases that you might be more familiar with, right? So if you set equal, sigma equal to zero, which means each firm can only interview a single candidate, right? Then what's the probability that you hire a high type worker? Well, that's the probability you hire anyone at all times the, the probability that the worker that you hire is, is high type, right? So this resembles basically the, the telephone line in a, in a lot of the money search literature. On the other hand, if sigma is equal to one, right? What's the probability that you hire a high type worker? Well, at that point, right? The only thing that's relevant for that is the queue of high type workers. The low type workers that are there never interfere with you hiring a high type worker. And so you get that that phi only depends on, on you. Okay. And so you see that the extent to which phi depends on lambda, right? Like the low types being there or not being there is a measure for like the frictions, the crowding out in, in, in the search process. And so, so this just generalizes that to arbitrary sigma basically like in between okay it turns out that that this phi is a sufficient statistic for basically everything like it's a sufficient statistic for the matching process and so it's enough to know phi for everything we want to do basically right it, you can write surplus in terms of phi you can write the firm's overall matching probability in terms of phi you just have to evaluate it in lambda lambda rather than the new lambda, uh, and, and we can also write the sorting conditions in, in terms of phi. So this is I'd like, if you don't like my micro foundation, uh, give me a different phi. We have to check some regularity conditions, but like a lot of our results go through. Okay, um, so let me go to Giuseppe's question, right? Like what is the trade-off for I wrote it here in terms of the planner, but, but the same is true for firms, right? There is a trade-off for firms in whether they want to attract low type applicants or not, right? The problem we just saw already is that low types might crowd out high types in interview, right? If a lot of bad workers apply, you can only interview some and you can't tell them apart initially, they may take up valuable interviewing spots, okay? The positive side about low type workers applying is that they provide some insurance. Given the frictional nature of the model, 
even if in expectation you're supposed to get 20 high types applying, it can always, there's always a positive probability that in fact zero of them apply. In that case, it's better to have a low type applicant than to have nobody at all. Okay, so that's, and, and, and so that's the trade-off firms need to consider. And so if they're really concerned about this, then they may want to keep low type applicants away altogether. They may want to set W1 equal to zero, okay? But they ha do have to realize that they give up on that insurance. Now, where does screening come in, right? Screening, the sigma, right? Crucially affects the degree of crowding out, right? This, this second point here, right? If sigma is equal to one, right? We had that the, the, the phi only depends on mu, right? The low types never interfere with you, you trying to hire high types, okay? And so there is actually no crowding out. And so it doesn't hurt, like there's only a plus. There's only a pro to, to having uh, low type applicants. Uh, but on the other hand, if sigma is equal to zero, like in Philip's work, the crowding out is very severe because you can only interview one guy and you're gonna draw that, that, that guy from, at, at random from the applicant pool. And so having too many low types is, is really problematic. And so you may actually choose to, to keep them away. Okay, and so the equilibrium um, is gonna look as follows in general. So, so on the left hand side, we have sigma is equal to zero. This is basically Philip's paper. We know we get perfect separation. Some firms, right, if there is enough complementarity in production, the high type firms here are going to be the ones attracting the, the high type workers, and the low type firms are going to attract the low type workers. On the other hand, if sigma is equal to one, right, and we are in a variation on Scheimer's world, right, he has an earned ball, we have a slightly different, but, but the idea is the same, right, high type firms want to attract both types of applicants, okay? Because the low types provide insurance at zero cost, okay? And so, does that answer your question, Giuseppe? Sorry, why do you say at zero cost? Going back to the formulation of the firm's problem as basically purchasing at a linear price Q length, sure. why isn't the price depending on the sigma. No, right, okay. So obviously you have to pay them to come. But, but in, in, in the, the, at zero cost in the matching with high type, right? So they don't, yeah. Uh, obviously you have to pay them their market utility and the market utility is gonna depend on what the sigma is. But they don't, there's no crowding out. Okay. Um, so, from this, right, it should be clear that if we want to try to talk about, if we want to talk about sorting, right, we're going to need a, a set-based notion of sorting. Right here, you can define sorting in terms of like a matching function that maps the worker type to the firm type, but here firms are not necessarily always going to match with the same type if, if sigma is positive. Okay, and so how do we define sorting? Here, basically, we follow Scheimer and um, Scheimer and Smith, uh, where we say like, okay, there's sorting if there's first order stochastic dominance in the distribution of hires. What does that mean in our setup, right? That basically translates to this object here. It's the probability that you hire a high type as a firm, conditional on hiring someone. And if you write down the expression for that, that's this, right? It's exactly that phi, the probability you hire a high type divided by the probability you hire anyone at all, okay? Now, if this probability is increasing in firm type, then we are gonna say the equilibrium exists, uh, exhibits positive assortative matching, okay? And, and if it's decreasing, then it's gonna be negative, assortative match. Okay, now, okay, so that's the definition of sorting, 
Now we want to write down conditions for which the definition is satisfied. Okay, and so as I, I, I previewed at the beginning of the talk, there's two elasticities that are going to be important for this. Okay, one on the production side. And so we're going to have what is known as the, the elasticity of complementarity, okay, which is really just the inverse of the elasticity of substitution, which you might be more familiar with. Right? And so it's defined as the cross partial of F multiplied by F itself divided by the, the, the partial derivatives. Right? And this is what Philip mentioned, I think, in a previous talk, like, like all these four show up here. Uh, it's not just the cross partial. Um, right, and so, so this, this elasticity of complementarity yeah. doesn't need to be constant. Of course, right, we all know examples, right, in particular CS production function in which it is. Right, and so we are going to use that as, a, as an illustration. Uh, Ron, there is a question from Shoyu. Hi. Uh, Shoyu, do you want to? As a remark on Philip's uh, earlier question, there you can see the if you have a TFP, it's not going to affect this number. The TFP is yeah. going to be. Oh, what I'm saying right. it's, it's hard. To, it, it's hard to vary f x y without also varying f and f x and f y. That's what I was trying to say. So it's a little bit hard to think about the comparative statics only with respect to f. Sure. Yeah, but you know this this index should have with you know, in my paper, in your paper with the accurate, I mean, it's true, they try to answer them would be difficult, but the TFP certainly doesn't matter. And like one thing that is true is, right, like these three, by definition, are all positive. So the sign of this is just going to depend on the sign of the, of the cross partial. Okay, so this, is, I think, is, 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 is standard and, and well understood. So let's go to the quality quantity elasticity, right? Because I think that's sort of um, novel to, to our model, right? If you want to find the boundary between positive and sortative and negative assortative matching, right? Then that boundary is where this H, this probability of hiring a high type conditional on hiring anyone is constant in Y. Okay, and so we want to look at contours of H. Okay. You can show that these contours are upward sloping. If you add more low types to the Q in order to keep the, the probability of hiring a high type constant, you also need to add more, more high types. You can also show that along these contours, the incentive to, for the planner to allocate high type workers or for the firm to attract high type workers is decreasing, right? And, and I think intuitively that makes some sense, right? A higher lambda and a higher mu means that, you know, it's gonna be more crowded. And so it, it is less useful to send extra high type workers there, okay? But importantly, that drop in that incentive is amplified when sigma is high. Because when sigma is high, already it was relatively easy to identify the high type workers that were there. And so ascending extra high type workers there is, 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 is um, less useful, okay? Now, it turns out that um, uh, to quantify this, the object that is relevant is, is this elasticity here. It's the elasticity of phi mu, the partial derivative of phi with respect to mu, with res the partial, no, the, the elasticity of that with respect to m prime. Okay, so let me talk you a little bit through what that is. Phi mu is the probability for a high type applicant to be hired and increase surplus because there was no other high type that was being interviewed. So it's the probability that he was the only high type being interviewed. Right? Whenever a firm interviews multiple high type workers, right, the other ones beyond the first don't increase surplus. If they hadn't been there, the firm would have still hired a high type. So we really care about that, that first high type, like the first high type that the firm identifies. 
identifying zero is not good, but identifying multiple is, is, is a bit wasteful too. We could have sent those high type workers to, to other firms, okay? So that's in the, the, the numerator. In the denominator, um, we basically have, I tend to think of this as, as just a rescaling of the, of, the, of the Q length, right? M prime of lambda is, is a transformation of lambda. It's the marginal impact of, of an applicant on, on the firm's hiring probability, right? And so why do we call this quality quantity, right? Because the first one is really about, you know, the quality of the applicant pool. What's the probability that we find a high type that, that increases surplus, right? Whereas the denominator is, is, is about the overall matching probability regardless of type. It only depends on, on lambda. So it's about the, 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 the total number of applicants. Okay, how am I doing in terms of time? You have 15, well, 20, okay. 30 minutes. Okay, that's good. Um, and so, okay, so you can define this for any mu and lambda. Okay, and, but what is going to matter, you can see that on the next page, is Right? So, so to, to, to derive conditions for sorting that hold true for any endowment of agents, okay, we are going to compare the lowest value that the elasticity of complementarity takes to the highest value that this quality quantity elasticity uh, ever takes. Right? So in order to ensure that we always have positive assortative matching, it needs to be true that the elasticity of complementarity is always larger than that quality quantity, right? So that's why we get the infant on the left-hand side and the supremum on the right-hand side. If this is not true, if, right, if this is, this were reversed, like, or if you can find um, values such that the elasticity of complementarity is smaller than the, right, then you, 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 you can construct counterexamples. Ronald, can I really ask you? Outside of the CS case, it seems this condition would have little bite. Why? What do you mean? You're taking an inf with respect to X and Y. Right. And let's say sort of design that F function to have a constant row. It seems... Yeah, I mean, well, the space of possible production functions is yeah. large, but... But I guess this is often the case in this literature. You're looking for conditions in which this is true for any population. For any, yeah. Um, no, I mean, and, and so, I mean... So let me... Ref like, uh, okay, may maybe you're just saying... You, you think that the... the right, so, so if... I don't have this on the slides, but, but if we flip the inequality and we write the, the supremum on the left-hand side and the infimum on the right-hand side, that's the condition for negative sorting. So maybe you're just saying that you think we, negative sorting is a more likely outcome in some sense. Um, yeah, I don't really have a, I mean, we derive the conditions and then you give me a production function, we can tell. I don't comes out of this. Now, this well, no, can I ask you yeah. also one question, yeah. please? Sure. It's just about the 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 A thing, right? So you yeah. so the, the the row has a very simple interpretation. It's yeah. as you said, it's the inter elasticity of complementarity, right? It has to do with the cross product of, of, of F, right? So without all your screening stuff, the A was also very simple. It's just the elasticity of substitution in the matching function. I know, yeah. It's a very, very easy object, right? I, we kind of know what it is. We know what the elasticity of substitution of the matching function is, you know, when you have vacancies and workers or whatever, yeah. right? So it's, 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 it's very intuitive. I, I, I see that you derive something that's very similar, but there's not a lot of intuition in the kind of object you discuss. I mean, I, I heard all the words, but I, I can't really put it together. So I was wondering if, 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 if you think there might be a way of getting something out of there that might ring a clearer bell on terms of 
Yeah, no, so something I mean, that we might be a little bit more familiar with. Right. So we have been thinking hard about this. We are still thinking like I, I don't disagree with you. I think it would be nice to have an even clear intuition. Um, now, yeah, in your work, it was just the elasticity of substitution, right? Now, of course, there is, there is, um, there's not just vacancies, but there's, or it's not just vacancies and the number of workers, but there's vacancies, the number of high types and the number of low types. And so it's not entirely obvious how to think about the elasticity of substitution in that case. So yeah, we, we are still, we haven't found the perfect intuition. Um, so, so if anyone has any ideas, I, I'll be happy to hear, but um, I think that's a fair point. Uh, but yeah, so far it's, it is a more complicated object than, than the one in your work. It, it converges to that, of course, if we send sigma to, to zero. Um, but yeah, right? like, I think, the, sure. the, I think it's, 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 like, it's clear that quality and quantity have to appear in there. Why they appear in exactly that way, that, that's still a little bit of a, a search. Um, okay, and so, so, okay, so this is the object that matters. If you now plug in the particular micro foundation that we have, right, you find that that supremum is one plus sigma over two. Okay, and so then you can, I mean, here this, the sorting condition is in terms of that elasticity of complementarity. Uh, if you prefer to have it in terms of supermodularity, as it often is done in this literature, you can use uh, Jan and Philip's definition of n root supermodularity, right? The function is n root supermodular, even only if the cross partial of the nth root is, is uh, of the production function is positive you can show there is a one-to-one -one relationship between that and this elasticity of complementarity. And so then, right, special cases of this are supermodularity, log supermodularity, square root supermodularity. So then you can phrase uh, our result in terms of, of, of supermodularity, right? So we get PAM if F is two over one minus sigma root supermodular. Now to make that a little bit clearer, the picture looks like this, right? So on the horizontal axis, I have the elasticity of complementarity right here. So here I assume CES, so the elasticity is constant, right? Here we have zero, so this means supermodularity. Here the elasticity is one, that means log supermodularity. Here we have a half, that means square root supermodularity. And so on the vertical axis, we have, we have sigma, right? So sigma is equal to zero, the horizontal axis that, that's Jan and Philip's work, they find that square root supermodularity is the dividing point between positive and negative assortative matching. And then sigma is equal to one, um, that, that's basically Scheimer's world. He, he doesn't analyze sorting results for, for arbitrary production functions, but he does some of it. And so here you see how the sorting conditions go from here to, to there. And so you see that it's upward sloping for positive assortative matching. And so you need stronger complementarities, the higher sigma. But can, I, can I comment on this? Because yeah. this is a bit your tagline of the paper, that uh, the, the relationship between sigma and this PAM condition. Sure. But in a sense, your PAM condition is just, it, it just, directional it's just a sign is not uh, a, st a strength, a strength. Mm -hmm. and the condition for which you define pam is for any arbitrary distribution there is another way you could think of the effect on sigma on sorting which is fix a population move sigma and see is there not just in terms of probabilities of hiring but um, maybe taking taking more of a stance on the slope of that derivative, whether that's also true. You know what I'm. Do you understand what I'm suggesting? Well, so there seem to be two things. So one is 
take a fixed endowment of agents and then vary sigma. Yeah, and measure the extent of positive. And, yeah, the second point seems to be about the strength of that. Yes. Um, my conjecture is if we take a fixed endowment, right, the, the, the influence of, of, of sigma on the sign is still going to be the same as we have here. The strength I need to think more about. Um, now, if you go back to that picture that we had earlier, let's see whether I can, I, you might still see, like, like if you measure the strength, maybe you want to call this very strong sorting and, and this a weaker form of, so, so you may still get something like that. But yeah, I need to think a little bit more about, about that. Um, and um, okay, so and the logic is the one you just explained, Ronald. The logic is that once you can interview more, you're going to bring in these low types as insurance, and that makes PUM somehow harder. Well, so logic? I think the, the it's it's about I, I would go back here, I think, where if, if, if there is a lot like, so, so if you consider the boundary, no sorting, right? Then the, um, and, and you look at, at firms that have longer queue lengths, then in order for them to have the same probability of matching, they need to have more high types. If they have more low types, they need to have more high types as well. But that means that the incentives to, to send high types to those firms goes down. And, and that is amplified by, you know, like you, you can imagine if it was very hard for firms to discover high types, sending a few more might help because it might make it easier. But if sigma is very high, even if not too many high types apply to that firm, then, then the firm already discovers it and, 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 and there is not much to be gained from sending extra high types. Can I make a general comment? Yeah. Okay. I like the people who work in this area, but I failed to see why it's interesting. At the end of the day, you're asking, if one input firm quality is a complement or substitute for another input high, uh, worker quality. I mean, it's like asking if tea and coffee are complements or substitutes. The only reasonable answer is it depends. And then I see it depends on the derivative of the log of a quadratic transformation of the utility function. You know, it's just not interesting. It's gonna depend first off on the matching process. Do high quality workers search in a pool of high quality firms or not? It's going to depend on the production function and there's no aggregate production function. Every firm is different. So why do you guys spend so much time on these, you know, silly conditions with the derivative of the log of something? I just don't get what, the, what I like the people who work in the area, but I think their time would be better allocated elsewhere. I, I disagree, obviously. Uh, <laughs> okay, fine. Tell me why. No, but I think, I mean, See, see, a large you see, this problem is interesting because Scheimer worked on it. He said that was interesting because E. Coden Kirker worked on it. No, they no, no, said but it was interesting because Gary Becker worked on it. Maybe no, Gary Becker was wrong and it's not interesting. That tries to identify sorting in the data, right? And we think that's important because if you want to know why inequality went up, right? Like one hypothesis is that the degree of the reason for is, racial inequality in the US is not the derivative of the log of some function. No, but so, so, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a silly exercise. It's a wonderful mathematical exercise. No, but, but I just don't see how this relates to inequality. To identify sorting, you need to, right, like what, what all these papers do is they assume some model, right? And, 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 and so understanding how the model assumptions affect the results that they find, I think is, is important. Anyway, let me use my last minute to actually- You can't say this is important because it's important. You have to say why it's important. 
and you suggested inequality, you know, I don't think it speaks to that issue in a serious way. So this is a, a common knot in your paper, which is a wonderful paper. It's on this literature. And it looks like, you know, mathematical masturbation to me. Yeah. I'm not going to in, favor, you know, in, in the next with somebody minute, you love. So let's keep it for the break and then. Yeah, we'll have 20 minute break to talk over yes, this. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, let me just briefly tell you what else we do. So we do negative assortative matching. We do, and again, this speaks to the data, right? Like traditionally literature has focused on, on sorting patterns among matches, right? But, but matches are actually uh, fundamentally different from applicant pools here. And so with more data becoming available on, on applicant pools, et cetera, you can also look at sorting patterns there. So we do that too. We can allow for noisy signals. Like I said, if you want a different micro foundation of the recruiting process, give it to me. We can, we can replicate the process. Let me just spend a few words on endogenous screening because it has come up a couple of times and somehow the link doesn't work. Uh, let me go here. Um, this is what I want to show you. Um, so we do an extension where we endogenize uh, screening, where there is a linear cost. So you can choose a sigma at a linear cost, c times sigma, okay, where c is a is a parameter. And so, because of this linear structure, firms are going to choose corner solutions here. They either choose sigma equal to zero, or they choose sigma equal to one. Okay. Now, to come back to Giuseppe's point earlier, if you want to maintain efficiency in this environment firms need to post their, their choice of stigma, okay? And so assuming that they do, or that workers somehow know, um, right, the efficiency result goes through. Now, what's interesting here, I think, is like, of course, for the endpoints, right, if, if the cost is zero or if the cost is infinite, right, we know what we get. We're back in the baseline model, the two extremes, right? This gives you sigma equal to one for all firms. This gives you sigma equal to zero for all firms. And we know that their log supermodularity is sufficient for positive assortative matching. It turns out that that's not necessarily true in the intermediate. Okay, so for intermediate C, uh, you, you can actually construct examples where log supermodularity may not be sufficient. And so you lose that, non -monoton uh, that monotonicity of the picture that I showed you earlier. And, and the reason here is that it's the firms with intermediate types that actually have the strongest incentive to invest in screening. Because they may want, uh, right, like the high type firms, if they're really keen on getting high type workers, they can just post W1 equal to zero and ensure that they only have high type workers. It's the firms in the middle that are gonna attract a combination of low and high type. And so they really need to do the ex post screening. So it's those firms that choose sigma equal to one whereas high type firms choose sigma equal to zero, but set wages in such a way that they only attract high types, in which case there is no point to, like there's no need for ex post screening anymore. And the low type firms only attract the low types here. Uh, I'm probably out of time. Yeah. So let me just conclude. Uh, where's the conclusion? I have trouble finding the conclusion. Um, well, you know what I wanted to say, right? So we construct a new model here. Here's the conclusion of, um, of sorting, right? That emphasizes the importance of screening. And then we show that the sorting patterns depend on that trade-off or right, that horse race between the elasticity of complementarity and the quality quantity elasticity. So let me stop here. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, we're running out of time and we'll have a close to 20 minute break and we'll reconvene at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So for attendees, if you have questions, you can still post your questions on Q&A. Yeah, thank you. That's great work. Can I still say something to Randy if Randy hasn't checked out yet? You still here, Randy? Yeah, out of the profession or out of the what? <laughs> no, out of, out of into the coffee break. I'm here. Um, I just wanted to be, be because I think it's a, 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 it's a super relevant question, right? Why, why would one do, do this type of work? And 
My interpretation of this type of work is that we would like to understand who is working where in the labor market, what wages they get and things like that. And for that, right, It froze. Philip, you froze. He must have gotten nervous. <laughs> now he's checked out. Hey, I'm not suggesting one can motivate this work in some interesting way, but it tends not to be motivated. The introductions are always, Ecoat and Kirker did this. We're going to generalize it. You go back to Ecoat and Kirker. They say, no, I agree. I agree. Schimer did no, that. Right. So my longer presentation has a more applied yep. motivation. But I thought in this audience and given well, it's true. This is a this is a specialized um, forum, so we can talk with the details of the model. But I don't know. It, it always seems can you hear me so now or not? We can hear you now. Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. All right. I, I just wanted to say that for some things, I think you want to think things through. And that's why I Donald on the interpretation, right? We would like to know, for example, how can it be that, that workers that might be very good in particular production processes are not hired there, right? Why did Shima Smith get, I mean, Shima Smith is an interesting case because they, they are, their conditions are not easy to understand. I'm not sure whether anybody looked at them recently, but there are four of them and they go up to the fourth derivative and so on. I, I don't think this is easy work. I think it's very good for building on it and quantifying and so on. But if you just wanted to think through what, what is actually the problem? If you have very easy conditions, I think sometimes it's easy to explain what fails, right? Why, you know, and in these matching frictions, I think that the usual problem is that you just don't want to wait that long, right? If you're a high type and you discount, right, you're going to take a crappy one, even if they're not good in production and that shows up in some of these conditions. You can make sense of them. You can think about how important do these matching frictions have to be relative to output. This type of mental logic, I think it's more interesting than knowing exactly whether it's root, square root, not root or something. And, and the, the, the nicer the conditions are, the, the more intuition I think we're gonna get for you know, which environments are the ones where we are really worried about matching frictions, messing up everything, and you're going to see very good workers working completely u uh, uh, unuseful machines, or in which environments things actually work out reasonably well, and production is what drives things. And yeah. I don't think we have thought much, much through about how it matters, whether you can actually figure out whether somebody's good or not, which I guess is what Ronald is doing. And I think if this condition that you have would be a little bit more transparent, I think people would have an easier time thinking through what, what goes wrong, doesn't go wrong, becomes easy, becomes hard. And at some point you're gonna show us the wages and they will probably also be affected in interesting ways that we can hopefully then think through. That, that thinking through I find more interesting than the exact formula for for, I you basically know, agree with that. I mean, by way of example, so you mentioned matching frictions. You know, people look at do say rich men marry rich women or good looking men marry, you know, look for positive assorted matching in the in the marriage market. And it comes down to the same thing about the, you know, whatever you want to say mathematically, it depends on whether they're complements or substitutes. But they failed to take into account that uh, of course, rich men marry a rich woman because that's who they meet in their, you know, the MBA program. They don't at Wharton. Right. They don't meet. They don't meet the women from West Philadelphia probably, or with, with a lower probability they meet them. So the matching process actually is really important, not only the production function for this for this right. issue. So I, I applaud that effort. So can I ask? But that's that's basically my take on it. Can I ask specifically about this model? We never saw any wages. I conjecture that the the idiots get paid more than the smart guys at uh, some firms. Is that right? And how do you think about that? So uh, it can happen for certain parameter values. That's basically the, the, the Shimer result. Uh, Shimer has that tool, but it requires that um, they, pay, the they get paid very difference. rarely. Sorry? Well, but, but they I get mean, paid very rarely. Exactly. And, and so the productivity difference should be small. Well, then, I mean, because the, small, the ones that are slightly better have a discreetly higher matching probability. But uh, I mean, you've been saying all the time that the high firms are having this insurance that they, they, they sort of attract the low types as insurance. and they have to pay for that in a high wage, right? If you're like number 20 in line, 
I mean, right. you're, not, you're going to ask for an enormous wage. Yeah. Right. No, well, so, yeah, so, so expected payoffs are, of course, increasing in type, but, but the wage, it's, right, it's matching probability times the, the wage. And so if the matching probability is much lower, so, then they have so, to I mean, be compensated. With it. On that, I mean, how do you feel about it? How hard is it to pretend to be incompetent? No, but wait, wait, wait. That, but in that, values, you still like to be, in values, you like to be smart. In values, you like to be smart, exactly. You're, you're still better off being smart. Your expected payoff is higher. You can pretend to be a fool and get paid a million dollars with probability. But still, I mean, is that something to take seriously? Uh, well, sometimes imagine that you are, you know, I don't know. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to think about that. It's like a substitute teacher that is there, standing there waiting for the call. And the call happens one day a year. And on that one day, that teacher is going to get paid a lot. Um, no, I mean, I think it's fair to criticize that, that prediction of these, these models, um, right? Which is if you want to take this to the data, that might be, might be an issue. Um, I think the purpose here is indeed to think more about like what are the forces that, that drive these matching patterns. Um, but yeah, fair enough. The, the paper is very pretty. It's really... Thanks. But uh, to tell me what does this geometric business be buys you over Poisson? No, so you can do, um, um, so, so you can do a Poisson number of applicants and a geometric yes. number of interviews, which is basically yes. read in my job market paper. Uh, it just makes expressions a little bit uglier, um, but, but it, it can be done. Um, the, the the geometric number you get, of instead of having these exponentials you get uh, fractions is that right so so the phi um so let's go to here right yeah yeah the, the, the phi i think would look something like this um Uh, times one minus e to the power. I see. Something like that. Um, so, I mean, it's, yeah, just different so functional can form. You, you can do it, right? Like no, 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 I understand. But this looks interesting to use in, just in general, in the toolbox. How do I think, it, I know how to think about the Poisson, it's just the Ernbaugh process. How do I think about this geometric thing? So for the applicants, it's Walking the, the right, like it, it's the uh, you line them up along a circle and they walk to the closest firm. And your and what's random is the position, your location in the circle. Your alloc yeah, exactly. Right. So oh, think okay. of telephone line question. matching. Right. You throw all workers and firms in a, in a, in a, in a, in a room and they yep. bilaterally Same. match yeah. randomly. This is basically an extension of that to, to many to one matches, right? Like, like but telephone line would just say I, like these, these can't meet, right? They can only be at mo most one, one. Um, right, 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 right. But there is something I don't understand. So I could, it looks from this picture that I could, straighten out the line, allocate the people, and it would, wouldn't it look like the, post, the earn ball structure? Why don't I get earn ball out of this? That's what I'm trying to understand. No, so if you straighten out the line, you're gonna have endpoints, right? That, that destroys the symmetry. Um, Maybe I'm missing what you have in mind. No, 
it seems like at the end of the day, a worker is going to be paired with one and only one firm. Exactly. Yes. And whom is it going to get? Who is he going to get paired is actually random. It's random, yes. You just need some, so I mean, even our ball is kind of a tie-breaking assumption about, like, within a sub-market, you just have a bunch of workers, a bunch of firms. Yes. Uh, the workers are indifferent between all the firms. Yes. And so you need some tie-breaking assumption about how you, you allocate. Can you think about getting back to earn ball as if it... You start with our firms. Own. Yeah. Well, you could do it on this line, but the circle, imagine that the firms are kind of equally spaced on the circle first and then randomly mm -hmm. allocate the workers. So it seems like you have different weights on the Right. Firm. I think that might and maybe oh, that's is that the way so? To do. so earn ball would be the case in which the firms are equally spaced. That might be right. I haven't I haven't checked that, but it sounds like but this is a further integral over that. Right. That's the, so there is an X, X element of, of randomization. Yeah, it would be nice to have like, I, I would find it useful to have just like uh, uh, a little note on how you... Right, right. What's different in the process? Because in terms of the language, it sounds the same. Right, no, it's You're very close. You're going to the market. Right. Yeah. You, you're going to find one firm right. and only one. Right. And I'm surprised that that doesn't generate always Poisson. There's got to be something right. about the right. memory. No, it might be, yeah, we should check. Equal spacing so, sounds like a good conjecture for, for getting our ball out of this. Arnold, can I ask you a quick question? question? Yeah. Um, this goes a little bit to, I guess, what Randy and some of these guys were asking. So. Uh, Moving a little bit away from the um, emphasis on PAM, not PAM, stuff like that. So for a fixed production technology, do you, I mean, are, are there ways to derive comparative statics on what happens as it gets kind of easier or harder to, I guess, interview candidates or, or as what you call, I think it was Sigma changes in terms of just the, the sorting and matching. I mean, you could, you could imagine for a given profession, say, you know, a new technology comes along that allows you to to screen workers more easily, more quickly, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, are, are there predictions that could come out of that that you could think a little bit harder about? Um... No, no I, I, I think that's right. And I think it's actually, um, we do look at that a little bit uh, sort of as an intermediate step in getting to, 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 to this result. Um, um, we don't emphasize it much, uh, but but like the paper has um, has a because condition. Because I, I think like the the emphasis on the PAMs. I mean, I understand why you guys are doing it and it fits into the literature nicely. But you also have a characterization of the equilibrium, right? Right. Uh, it, it's kind of an intermediate step, which I, I, I kind of think there's maybe I'm wrong, but I thought there was some contribution there by itself. Right. No. So we have some proposition that says, like, for a given distribution of agents, in order to get positive sorting, this is what. Right. Of course, then more stuff is going to matter. The distance between x one and x two is going to matter. Right. So, so one thing that. No, that's why I was saying uh, fix everything, but change change one dimension. Right. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. like. Uh, no, we can do that. You know, it's like. What happens if every dean gave the you know the economics departments right. twice the budget in one year? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I mean, obviously you'd have you know probably positive effect on output, but what would happen to sorting and screening? Would 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 you know, Toronto still fly out? Uh, you know this and that. I mean, I don't know. That, that seems. Because like in a, a sense, in a sense, the conditions for PAM under any distribution for applied work, who cares about that? You care about oh, right? No, but I mean, yeah. The world I mean, as it is. Well, I mean, the conditions well, a bit cleaner. So well, I mean, it's not like we know we don't know the distribution of types in the data. I mean, what what's the type? So there's value in doing these statements because it's hard to measure type. So no, I well, when I you agree. go to empirical work, back. you make a choice there. Yeah. When you go to empirical work, you say I know, like, but there's modus, yeah, education. Sure. 
But can I ask you something, Ronald? It's sure. almost one. Oh yeah. We'll start. Who's one, next? At one o'clock. Uh, Faye, Faye's next. Right? It's gonna be me. Where's Lonis? Yeah. Faye, do you wanna? Yeah, Lonis hasn't joined yet. Yeah, Faye, you wanna go ahead and, and load your slides? Should we remind Lonis too? I did. But I Michael, in, Michael is here. Yep. Yes, yeah, co-authors. Michael's here. He should present. I be the backup. <laughs> Don't don't let Lonis in so that Michael yes, I, I vote Michael percent. All right. Oh, uh, Ronald, do you want to unshare your slides so oh, yeah. they, Faye can share this? Sure. Um, okay. All right, can everyone see my slides? Okay. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, so I'm going to talk about pricing and inventory management. This is a joint work with Charlie Murray, Tsan Tian, and Yi Yi Zhou. So you've got a paper written by a uh, micro theorist and a two empirical IO economist and a macroeconomist. So this is a living proof for economic community doesn't have to be divided. So I guess the world doesn't have to be divided as well. Um, so most of the transactions in the real world are made through some sort of intermediary or middleman. And uh, a classic justification of the existence of middlemen is that there is search friction. There is a literature built on this observation. So what we're going to do is that in the search literature, we typically assume those middlemen and the dealer exist because they have some advantage in either the matching technology, it's less costly for them to meet buyer and a seller, or they have some storage advantage. It is cheaper for them to hold inventory. And what we're gonna do is to take this literature as given and keep asking the question, uh, if the dealer does not completely eliminate search friction, that means uh, he still faced the risk of stock out. And what's going to happen that, uh, in that situation, a dealer will have to solve two problems. One is inventory control. You have to decide when you want to make a new order from producer or upper stream uh, seller and how many units you want to order. And you need to also solve a revenue management problem that is the dynamic pricing problem in the retail market. What price you want to change? When you want to change your price? This is not only relevant in theoretical world, but also very relevant in practice. Most of the uh, retailers or uh, dealers we think about, the, we can think about in the real world, actually use some algorithm to decide their price and order decision based on their inventory and those algorithms are written by operation research scholars, and typically they assume there are some monopolists and solve some dynamic control problem. So what we want to do is to introduce a search theoretic model with multiple intermediaries or middlemen. They all use those algorithm. They all use inventory-based uh, uh, order and uh, pricing algorithm and they solve dynamic optimization problem. And we want to see what's going to be the implication on price dynamics and what's going to be the implication on price dispersion. Okay. Uh, so you're going to see a simple directly search model, very stylized. Just want to show the basic idea. There will be frictions in both retail markets where the intermediary or dealer have to interact with buyer. And there will be search friction in something we call the wholesale market, where the dealer will interact with producers or sellers. Both markets can be frictional, so people need to search in both markets. And the dealer will control their inventory dynamically and decide their price dynamically. And you will see that in this ex ante homogeneous world, uh, there will be within distribution price dynamics, and you will see a single peaked price dispersion in a steady state. And the model, because it's uh, simple enough, we can extend it to allow multi-unit purchase and to resemble the classic SS rule and int easily introduce heterogeneity to answer uh, 
uh, a number of classic questions in I.O. and the marketing literature. And at the end, if we have time, uh, I will show you that we empirically uh, exam the connection between inventory and the price uh, in a big market, which is a used car market. And the intermediary in this market is going to be used car dealer. So I will skip the literature because of the uh, time constraint. So I will jump to the model. Time is continuous and lasts forever. And we will, we will do a partial equilibrium analysis focusing on one market. Uh, in this market, people trade some indivisible good. And we have many short-lived buyers and the sellers, they arrive at each time. Uh, I assume it's important, uh, we, uh, I assume they are short-lived, so there's no way uh, uh, they can have any long-term contract being signed. By the way, if you have questions, you can ask me, and also you can type uh, on the chat. So I, I assume my co-author will be there to answer your question. Both Let me there. ask what you mean by short life. Is this a static model? Well, it means that the buyer only leave for, for one. Right. Uh, so for like Ruben Stein Walensky assumed that, so you're in good company. They're famous. Say it again. In the famous Middleman paper by Ruben Stein and Walensky, they also assume buyers and sellers are in the market for one purchase or one sale only, while the middlemen are long live. So you're in good company with that assumption. I'm not sure. I, I think there's some noise. I, Just say I, I, yes. I, okay, yes. Exactly. Okay. I'll, say, I'll, I'll type up a chat comment. To you. Okay. Yeah, please do that. Oh, you can speak louder. Uh, uh, so this, each of the seller, for simplification, we assume has a unit supply, and this is just for the base model. You can easily extend it. Seller has zero reservation value. A buyer gonna have some unit demand, and uh, the utility conditional getting the good consumption gonna be u bigger than zero. We assume they can't meet directly, so they have to rely on some intermediary to uh, conduct their transaction. Okay, so what we're gonna focus on is gonna be the dynamics of dealers. So there will be a unit measure of dealers and they are long lived. They are doing dynamic optimal control. They buy from sellers because they can't produce and they sell to buyers in different markets. And those dealers can hold the inventory and we use this uh, notation X, which is a natural number uh, and they come up with a flow cost of holding inventory, which is CX. This is going to be an increasing function and it's going to be convex, a standard assumption. So search is directed, given the audience, I don't think I need to apologize for this assumption, uh, but our insight doesn't uh, critically rely on search being directed. They just make our analysis easy. So we have both retail market and the wholesale mar uh, sub market indexed by the retail price P and the wholesale price W. Each of the sub market gonna have a constant return to scale matching function. And I'm gonna abuse terminology to say uh, in each of the sub market, there is a market tightness and uh, theta is the retail market tightness that will be the measure of buyer divided by the measure of dealer in that sub market. And lambda gonna be the market tightness of the wholesale market, and that will be the measure of seller divided by the measure of dealers. So all it matter is that for every dealer in a sub market, which is the average uh, buyer or seller you get in that sub market. So a dealer gonna choose a pair of uh, price, prices at each moment. So you can change the price dynamically. A retail price P and a wholesale price W. By choosing a retail price P, that means you enter a retail sum market index by price P and enter choosing W, uh, w means that you enter a re, uh, wholesale sum market W. And there will be corresponding uh, market tightness. And that means you can meet uh, a buyer and a seller at some rate because it's continuous time. We don't need to worry about 
the event where you meet one buyer and the seller simultaneously at each moment. So I have a comment, maybe you can hear me better now. Can you hear me? Yeah. In these markets, the many markets, the relationship between the middleman and the buyer is a long lived uh, enduring relationship. You go back to the same restaurant quite right. often. Right. That's, that's not necessarily key because there are other relationships between buyers and sellers, which are basically you make one purchase, you know, you buy a new car every five years. Say. Yeah. But, but the, the middlemen, their relationship with their suppliers is almost always long lived, right? The dealer for a car only meets a buyer every so often, but he's always dealing with the same, you know, Ford or General Motors. If you might think about enduring relationships here, especially between the middlemen and the, and the suppliers. Right. Very good. So if you think about a new car market, yes, long-term relationship going to be uh, going to matter. And if you want to apply this model into other retail market where you have producers and say supermarket, the long-term relationship definitely matter. But uh, yeah, okay. I mean, your yeah. your your model is a model of what's called flipping. Yeah, yeah. And but you you see that in this, we're going to use Mendo, uh, Menzu and Xi framework it's relatively easy to introduce long-term contract because everything's going to be efficient. So I just want to make things extremely simple to shut out all the uh, long-term interaction between agents in the base model. Say, can I ask a quick question? Sure. Kind of following up on Randy. So should we, I mean, I guess then we should just think about this as maybe a good model of non-durable goods, but not one for durables where you might think about waiting a little while or something. That's right. Yeah. Well, well, I guess it depends on, uh, yeah, okay, I agree with you, yeah. Um, oh, you can imagine that it's a durable good market, but the intertemporal concern of the consumer or the uh, seller is less important than the inventory management concern. Okay, but at the end of the day, you will see that what I need is to get some downward sloping demand function on the retail market and upward sloping uh, supply function in the wholesale market. And how to microfund it, it's not very important. Right? This is just the simplest way I can get it but I'm sure there are a way to get it even with, with throw away some of the assumption, All right? So on the buyer set and the seller set, it will be extremely simple. Uh, we're gonna assume a buyer, if a buyer is willing to pay a flow cost kappa B, he will be able to search in one, exactly one retail sub market at that moment. And if a seller is willing to pay a search cost kappa S, he will be able to search in exactly one wholesale sub market at that moment. So the dynamics you can see is going to be on the dealer side, just like in the labor search, the dealer will be the, uh, the, the walker and buyer and, firm, uh, and seller will be the firm. And just make sure you remember what's going on. You have some seller and the seller has, caught, uh, has some good enter some sub market and he will meet some dealer and the, the good going to travel from seller to dealer and the dealer will also randomly, uh, sorry, we will we'll search in some retail market and sell, car, uh, sell good to some buyer who choose to enter this sub market. Okay. So I hope you can see that this is essentially just Menzu and Xi's framework. So the only relevant uh, state is going to be a dealer's inventory. And we can write on the dealer's HJB function. When the dealer has inventory X, what he does is that he choose price, retail price and the wholesale price. The dealer need to, at each moment, a dealer need to pay the flow inventory cost. And there's some probability at this rate uh, determined by the matching function and the market tightness of the sum market he choose to enter, he will meet a buyer. And in that market, there will be trade happen and you, uh, the, the dealer get the price P and his inventory change from X to X minus one. And also 
because you also enter some wholesale market, you will meet a seller with some probability and he purchased a unit and paid the price and his inventory will change from X to X plus one. So, because we assume the inventory will be greater than or equal to zero, uh, it's necessary to add a boundary condition so that V minus one is gonna be sufficiently low so you will never go down to that power. And because of the simplification assumption on a buyer and a seller set, there will be free entry conditions in each sub market, which is active. So each of the buyer gonna have zero surplus, which means that uh, the buyer's probability to match the dealer uh, multiplied by the surplus, U minus the price, gonna be exactly equal to the search cost KB. Kappa B. And on the, on the wholesale, in the wholesale market, the seller will have a similar zero profit condition. The expected profit, uh, the expected revenue will be exactly equal to the search called Kappa S. So clarifying question. I take yep. it you do not let sellers go directly to the retail market. Is that no, correct? No, that's completely It'd be sure. interesting to endogenize that. Yeah, yeah. As, uh, that's right. It would be interesting to allow more uh, possible channel to trade, right? And then because utility gonna be transferable, we use Menzio and Xi's trade, cancel out the price. So we get this uh, social planner problem in a separate form. So the efficient solution is gonna be for each of the uh, inventory, uh, we assign some uh, market tightness for this dealer and we choose theta and the lambda. And this is nothing but you pay the inventory cost, and then there will be a retail market transaction surplus, which is gonna be the probability of matching multiplied by the social surplus we created, the conditional matching, the consumer gonna get U, and the uh, intermediary gonna uh, reduce his continuation value, and then we'll get some social cost to pay. On the wholesale market side, it will be very similar, uh, but the, 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 the seller gonna get a zero uh, profit anyway. Uh, so the seller gonna get W, but W uh, is from the, uh, from the dealer, so that cancel out. The social surplus we create of matching is just the increasing of the dealer's continuation value, and then we pay the social cost of matching, uh, maintaining this, uh, maintaining this uh, market tightness. And having, sol uh, having uh, solved this theta and lambda policy function, we can plug them into the free entry condition. So we'll get the equilibrium price as a function of the dealer's inventory. But uh, it's worth to mention that because of the standard directed search trade-off, each of the buyer and the seller will get a zero profit in the expectation. So the free entry condition on the in the retail market gonna essentially give us a law of demand. There will be a negative relation between P and the market tightness. And the free entry condition in wholesale market gonna give us a law of supply, which is gonna be a positive relation between W and the market tightness lambda. Everything is very standard. Hey, um, sorry, just a quick question. I mean, I don't, <clears throat> I mean, that's very standard, usually, the free entry can be posed on the side of the agents who post prices. Here, the middlemen are in finite supply, they post prices, and the other agents who take prices given do free entry, is that right? Well, it's up to different interpretation. Uh, one way is to think there is some market maker and uh, uh, intermediary buyer seller just choose which market to enter. And my interpretation of this uh, uh, choosing market to enter is that we interpret this as the dealer to decide what price he's gonna charge. And the short answer is yes, you're right. I mean, I don't understand. So suppose you write V of X equals zero. V of X equals zero. Uh, yeah. That's a free entry condition. Oh yeah. Uh, okay, that's a different one. Does it give rise to the same demand and supply? That's the usual one you impose in direct search. The guy who's posting prices then keeps coming in. So I don't allow- I don't think what you're doing is standard. I may be missing, yeah, anyway. I don't so, think it's wrong. I'm just saying, I think it sounds reasonable. There's a finite number of dealers there and there's kind of customers coming in and out, but 
it doesn't seem standard to me. That's what I'm saying. All right, just, right. To so, point, just to point out the difference. Anyway, go ahead. Right. So I have a, a I have a fixed measure of uh, dealers. So their profit is gonna not going to be driven to zero. But if you allow free entry condition in dealer's market, then that will drive, say, V0's profit, uh, V0's value to be zero by assuming every dealer can freely entry. And then when you en enter your current continuation value, V0, holding zero uh, inventory, going to be zero. Not much will change. Not V0, V1. I mean, as a seller, I can be a middleman. If I have a car to sell, I can decide to be, be a car dealer. Somebody has this stuff, right? So anyway. But Faili, I it sounds like it does. I mean, you, you work with steady states and so on. I mean, you could have a fixed number of sellers and a Very fixed good. number of buyers. It would just determine the KB and the KS endogenously. I don't yeah. think it matters. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and that will help us because then we can evaluate the consumer surplus to answer a more classic I.O. question. It's just one way first to set up this model. We are more ambitious. We are hoping we can get some data with aggregate fluctuation, but we did not. And the model set up is just history dependent. But you are absolutely right. We don't need block recursive. We don't need uh, distribution free property. Yeah. Okay. And so, okay. So a simple lemma, the value, the difference between uh, Vx plus one and Vx, which is the marginal benefit of having one more unit of inventory, going to be decreasing in inventory. This is because the reason you want to have inventory as a dealer is to, low, to lower the risk of stock out. And obviously, that will make your value function increasing when uh, the inventory is small, because increasing x is going to make the stock out uh, risk smaller. But when, because of the search friction, for a positive measure of time, the probability you're going to have many, many uh, buyers coming is going to be very small. And as the, time you, uh, as the number of current inventory become higher and higher, the chance of uh, stock out in the uh, foreseeable future is going to become smaller and smaller. Did you prove hey, that or are you just asserting it's true because it's intuitive? I know other models of middlemen where the value function is not concave. Right, of course. I'm because it works through the prices. You know, the equilibrium prices adjust when you change. Right. So, uh, of course, it highly depends on the, the intuition is uh, high, uh, highly depends on this specific model. But you uh, say you hey, proved that there is concave. Say it again. Question. Your Did you prove it's concave or you just assume it's concave? The value I prove it's concave. Okay. I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. Imagine there is a dealer who has X unit uh, inventory. Imagine he mimic a dealer who has X plus one unit of inventory, do whatever he does until his inventory process hit X minus one. And then you're gonna get a continuation value almost like this X plus one guy, but the difference is that until this random time when your inventory hit X minus one, you're gonna pay a different inventory holding cost will be discounted and your continuation value after this time will be different. It will be X minus V X minus one instead of V X because this is potentially suboptimal. Then your all the proof you, you move on with this detail. I see the proof. So it's correct. Yeah. So then you can easily prove this, right? Of course, this highly depends on uh, my specification in, other model, it may not be as easy as this one to prove the... Hey, your logic for the V being concave didn't seem to rely at all on C being convex. Exactly. So concavity only depends on the diminishing risk of stock out. Right, but, that's correct. But if you don't have the, the cost of inventory holding, the value function will always be weakly increasing, which is not the big deal. But in some market, if you want to take this into the data, then you may want to find some upper bound. And uh, then uh, having a inventory holding cost is going to help you eventually to make uh, 
your value function to be decreasing for very large x. You will never see any inventory at that level. So, yeah, I have a question. Actually, I am. Um... Yeah. So actually, <clears throat> I'm surprised that Randy asked a question because this model is very much similar to uh, Shevchenko's model for inventory on money search models. In his model, the cost C is constant, right. and it's per unit. Yeah, it, indeed, he gets this uh, concavity. Of course, he doesn't have a direct search, he has a random search. Right. Uh, I'm not sure I know that paper. I read his IER paper out in, uh, about intermediary, and it's my impression he doesn't uh, focus on price dynamics and the price dispersion. And maybe the, the monetary uh, uh, search model is different. I will have to check that. Sure, sure. I'm just thinking that, I'm just saying that the concavity is actually more general con yeah. in contrary to what Randy said. Okay, thank you. All right, so <laughs> the, uh, it, it seems the intuition is pretty clear that the value function is concave. And because we, we also have a, uh, 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 cost function that will make value function eventually be decreasing. But because the concavity of value function doesn't depend on the search cost, so you can imagine you can maybe extend this model to not just uh, on inventory holding, but also on asset holding. And the cost will become negative, so it will be interpreted as some sort of uh, uh, return of holding the asset. Right, and because of the concavity, everything become easy. The new classic uh, intuition gonna come through. When the, uh, the inventory is very high, then the uh, benefit of increasing inventory becomes small. And what's gonna happen is that the dealer gonna be desperate to sell as quickly as he can because the inventory cost is too high. And the Just a heads up, this is the driving force. Uh, you don't cite the paper by Carrasco and me, but the concavity of the value function and all these forces you're talking about just submerged there. We just solved the decision problem. We totally characterized it, but you should definitely look at that because I mean, Randy's saying that he's seen con concavity not elsewhere, but this is undeniably, this is, there's a diminishing returns to optionality. Right. And you don't need anything in the cost function or whatever. It's just simply if you, you acquire more units, you're going to unload them farther and farther in the future. Yeah, you don't need Period. that. And this is actually the proof I'm using is from OR literature in the in the 70s. So this, the decision problem is really standard. It's just that the OR people never uh, endogenize the uh, market to price, and they never have uh, some market for buyer and the seller. But the concavity is very standard. So it's a lemma. It's not a theorem. Uh, proposition. How can they make a living doing such simple things? Because they want to sell the dynamic model to real world seller and they're going to use this model to build the algorithm. And that's the price you see in Walmart, in Whole Foods. It's not human being who decide the price in this company, right? So someone needs to provide that. Uh, let me continue. So this result is as intuitive as the last one. So this is Econ 101. If you have a lot of inventory, you want to sell very quickly. In direct search, the only reason you can sell very quickly is to lower your retail price to enter that sub market. And because you have a lot of inventory, you don't want to order inventory unless the inventory is cheap. So you will lower your wholesale price, enter the market to order very slowly. And those two false actually work on your stock of inventory to, uh, to the same direction. When you have a large number of inventory, what's going to happen is you buy slowly and you sell quickly in the expectation that will push your future inventory down. If you have a smaller number of inventory, you want to buy quickly and you want to sell slowly by charging different price. And that will push your next period inventory to be higher in the expectation. So this means that if you look as, a, as an outsider, if you look at the inventory process, 
it's going to be some sort of mean regressing process. Right? And also, the retail price and the wholesale price will co-move over time, commonly driven by the dynamics of inventory change. Whether the markup is going to be negative or positive correlated with uh, uh, inventory, it's going to depend on the elasticity of smashing function in retail and wholesale market. So you can get both positive and negative uh, correlation. And the search friction means that you can't uh, frequently sell or buy and fix your inventory, the theory tell you your retail price and wholesale price will be constant. So this tell you you're going to have a sticky price adjustment because you have a sticky adjustment of inventory. Can I just briefly ask, it sounds so intuitive that I'm surprised we have not already worked that out before. Exactly. So uh, I don't know why. So, so this is just something, okay. Yeah, Just I don't know why. kind of related, but actually clarifying. So, uh, host, a wholesaler is never possibly matched with multiple people at one time. Is it? It's, 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 wholesale, yeah. it's just the rate that's different. Exactly, rate, yeah. But if you have multiple matching, then higher capacity can give you this extra kick. Very good. So, I will, uh, I hope I have time to talk about the extension. Uh, and also here, I assume the seller, each of the seller has only one unit. And you can easily imagine this is not very realistic because you if you have a low X, you probably want to contact multiple seller to immediately get uh, more inventory. And I think I have a one page, if I have time. So immediately you can see because this mean uh, regression uh, process, the steady state distribution of the inventory going to be single peaked. The most density going to be concentrated at the mean or the mod. And when you deviate from that uh, mean or mod level of inventory, the measure is going to become smaller and smaller. And because the price, the retail price, is a monotone function of inventory holding, so the distribution of retail price is naturally going to be single peaked. And we have, we can easily make extension because this is a standard block a recursive equilibrium model. We can assume these are gonna be heterogeneous. We can assume consumer's measure is fixed. So we're gonna use the market utility approach to solve the equilibrium welfare of the consumer. And we can allow pro production uh, differentiation by introducing some idiosyncratic match quality. And we can also allow a seller to provide the multiple unit and we can resemble uh, the classic SS rule uh, for some parameter. So uh, I would just give you uh, some illustration. So uh, horizontal product differentiation is match specific quality and the buyer gonna have some IID uh, utility, either zero or, or, one, or, or U. And then once a match happen, there will be a probability the buyer will find one of the, uh, one of the inventory the dealer has is a good match. So this is going to give a dealer, the dealer an extra benefit to hold more inventory. Because if you have more inventory, it's more likely a buyer can uh, find a better match. Can and this break the concavity result? That exactly. That will, for some parameter, we, we run some simulation. For some parameter, it will destroy the single peak uh, result. And you can allow multi-unit seller because it's a directed search. It basically means that the seller can choose a submarket, a wholesale submarket to, uh, to enter. And that wholesale uh, submarket is going to be indexed by the total price of the bundle. And Y is going to be the number of unit you are selling. And there will be free entry condition. So the dealer's problem is that how many unit I want to order and one I want to order. For some parameter, you can imagine that there will be a simple SS rule. When your inventory is very high, although there is still benefit to order, but you don't order. You wait until the inventory lower, uh, is lower than some cutoff value, and then you try to search in some market so that you can order a lot. The reason is the intuition is very simple because we can transform the problem as a social planner problem, and uh, creating some supply will require entry cost. And this entry cost will serve as the fixed 
uh, purchase costs as scarves 1960 paper. So you have some, uh, uh, you have some uh, accessory. All right, I'm running out of time. Uh, so I wanna briefly talk about data. It's very difficult to find a good data to test this theory, because most of the data you don't have seller's inventory. So we have this used car market data. Used car market is important. Inventory is important. It's frictional. Dealer is important. Guys, what do you mean by test this model? I mean, it's... So I want to test the channel uh, that the inventory, can the dealer's inventory affect the retail price uh, is important. So but to do that, I need to see the dealer's inventory You're data. You're testing the idea that larger inventory you lower prices. Exactly. Is, I want to see. I which also, is almost model free. I mean, a large number of models. Would right. Be that. <clears throat> well, right. But the pr price dispersion may not be single picked. We also well, we, we know it's not in the table. Uh, depends on uh, depends on what. Oh, you sorry. Do. Single peak. Yes. Single oh. peak. Actually, a lot of market have single peak price dispersion. <laughs> but and again, lots of models would generate that too. You kind of test it. I don't know. That is true. So I'm going to argue there is very important a realistic channel, which is inventory dynamics can naturally give you that. And it's hard to argue the inventory uh, concern. I mean, you could say you're testing it against, say, Burnett Judd or some other model. There is something compare. a bit, there, there is one element that is a bit unique to this model, which is the <coughs> simultaneity of uh, purchasing and uh, selling. Very good, yeah. In, in, S, in models with fixed cost of inventory adjustment, you either do one thing, the other thing, or nothing. Right, right, right. So uh, the first version of this model is a discrete time model. And we, like in the most of the labor search model, we assume the uh, intermediary can only search in one sub market. Then you need to face the choice that whether you want to go to a uh, retail market or you want to go to a uh, wholesale sub market. So that will slightly change the result. But I, I, I feel that either I, I allow them to endogenously choose re between a retail or, or wholesale, or randomly let them to uh, make a, 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 a draw to decide which market to, to enter. Either way is artificial. So eventually we decide to go to continuous time to avoid this question. Yeah. But you have to make some restriction on the frequency of search to make search friction to be important. Okay, so I have about 10 minutes, I guess, five minutes. So let me briefly talk about the empirical result. Um, so used car market, you sell used car, you buy used car, it's hard to have long-term contract. I don't constantly give, have used car to sell, although some of the intermediary will purchase in auction, but even that is not a long-term contract. So we get data from this website. Hey, can I ask about that real quick? Sure. So it seems like in the used car market, you do get a lot of reallocation amongst the dealers in these Very options, good. but you, yep. don't, you don't have that in the model. Can you talk so about that? You, right, so in the model, we definitely don't have that, but you can imagine that for a dealer, so what, what, what is important for us is that for the dealer, if you want to make, make order quickly, you have to increase the purchase price. And I can imagine, even though you per, a, a dealer purchase from an auction, uh, all from other dealers, the similar uh, net, uh, positive correlation between the purchase price and the purchase probability gonna be there. It's just no matter what, we do not observe anything on the wholesale side. We only observe at what time the dealer get new cars. We don't know whether it's from auction, we don't know whether it's trade-in or reallocation. So that's, that part is definitely, uh, a simplification because of lack of data. Yeah. All right. So cars.com require all the registered dealers to uh, list their inventory and update in real time, although they may not do that. Uh, but that we don't, we don't know. We just assume they're going to update data. And we have observation in 2017 in Ohio. And we have Every used car's detailed information, their make, model, gears, train, color, mileage, so we can control the heterogeneity at the car level. 
uh, whether this car is certified by the dealer, listing history, when the price is going to change, when the car is added, when the car is removed. So we have weekly frequent observation, and we focus on non-luxury uh, passenger cars, which is not too old. 20 years old, older car, we don't, we don't look at them. And obviously, used car market uh, is, uh, has a lot of heterogeneity. Cars are different, and dealers are also different. So we, the, the, uh, we, we divide the entire sample into two, uh, eight products, whether it's sedan or it's SUV, and we divide four different uh, age groups. Using this eight uh, uh, index, we define eight products. So we do so to we we do believe within a product there will be still a lot of heterogeneity from the consumer's perspective, but we implicitly assume that from a dealer's perspective, a five years Honda and a five years Toyota are probably uh, very substitutable, and because we focus on dealers manage uh, inventory management problem, so we only go to eight products. And obviously, we can go to 80 products. We just have less observation within each product. And a dealer will, will sell multiple products in real world. For simplification for now, we just trade each of the dealers selling different product as a separate different uh, dealer. So it's going to be product dealer combination. OK, just letting you know you have five minutes. Say it again? Just letting you know you have five minutes. OK, good. Uh, and we look at balance panel, so we only consider dealer product combination with positive inventory at each week. So that eventually we have a large sample, 700 dealers, a lot of cars, and a lot of weekly observation. And uh, typically it will take some time for a car to be sold, about eight weeks, and there will be some initial price, about 16,000. And the last list price will drop, so the price trend is negative. And uh, the, for each car, the standard deviation, this is the intertemporal price fluctuation, is about $400. On average, agent, uh, dealers hold different inventory, and the mean is going to be 13, because for each dealer, your inventory will fluctuate. This is your over time expectation. I have a comment related to labor search. It's, yeah. At least it was at one point well known in that literature that unobserved heterogeneity generates an artificial time dependence. So it looks like the prices are going down with, in the labor market, it looks like the wages are going down with duration of unemployment. That's just because the good workers get hired first and the ones who stay. So it could be that way with cars too. If it's unobserved to you, heterogeneity, then. Very good, yes. And also. You want to think about that, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, very good, very good point. There, there's actually, uh, we, we actually look at the turn on the market effect, and it also reflects some sort of learning of the local demand. Maybe over time, the dealer realizes this car is not very popular, so you have to lower the price. And True. we see that and actually also, bigger dealers is more sensitive to turn on the market effect. They adjust the price more frequently. You can imagine maybe those dealer uh, uh, can afford more sophisticated revenue and the inventory management algorithm, and small dealers just need to rely on their smart hat. Okay, so we want to test whether inventory change will affect sales probability, order probability, and retail price. Unfortunately, we don't see the wholesale price and wholesale process. And we want to see uh, the long term distribution of the inventory and retail price, whether they are unit model or not. So we run some simple regression. Uh, we uh, look at the uh, inventory F uh, with some product at some time, what is your inventory, and some other control, and to see how that's going to affect your purchase uh, and, and, and the sales. Uh, because I don't have time, I, I can show you we, there's some endogeneity con concern. But roughly speaking, the coefficients support our uh, theory. So there is a negative correlation between inventory and the sales uh, orders, and the positive correlation between inventory and uh, 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 and uh, 
sorry, negative co correlation between inventory and other positive correlation between sales, which is measured by remove and uh, inventory. Say, is this true also after taking out um, dealer fixed effects? Exactly. So we th th that's the reason there is some endogeneity. We have this dealer fixed effect uh, because dealers are very heterogeneous. So we have to do some first order difference to kill that. But then yes. we get some of uh, some endogeneity. So we're going to use the previous period inventory as an IV to estimate this. Uh, this coefficient. But then the problem is that you may imagine, even though the inventory as a state variable is theory correlated, but there may be a rational expectation making previous period inventory to be correlated with future period demand or supply shock. So there's no perfect way to solve it, which is change different lag period in hope that this rational expectation effect gonna disappear once we go two months uh, uh, later. And so you can see one unit of inventory increase will decrease the order per week and increase the remove uh, uh, per week. In, uh, sorry, increase it. We do the price regression, then this is going to be the regression at the car level. So we need to have the car fix effect. So basically, the result is similar. And you can see there is this time on the market effect. When time on the market becomes longer, the, the price will be lower. And this effect is stronger when you look at a larger dealer. Okay, so we briefly look at the inventory, but we, I don't have time. So I control the uh, seasonality and heterogeneity using very similar technique in Guido's paper. So we look, we see that after normalization, the, the distribution of the inventory is pretty much a single peak. This is the aggregate distribution and we do the deep test to, to see each individual product dealer, whether it's single peak. 80% gonna be single peak and other are not. But those dealer who has non-single peak distribution are very big. So it's possible our normalization is biased. We, we also do the same thing for the price and the price is, is 95%, 4% is single peak. All right, so to summarize, uh, we got a, a search theoretical model to answer a classic I.O. question, and we can incorporate inventory control and revenue management. We got a natural channel to explain price dynamics and uh, uniform dis uh, unimodal price dispersion without any exogenous heterogeneity. And we have some empirical support from a big market. Any question? What did you see about price stickiness? Uh, that's is a very, any? so actually, okay, price is sticky. Uh, on average, correct me if I'm wrong, Charlie and Yi, I think on average, within eight weeks, the price only change two or three times on average. Yeah, that's about right. So it's pretty sticky. It is probably because, uh, so we don't need any uh, manual cost, but it is, possible in reality people just get lazy doesn't want to update the price in real time and also possible is because the inventory doesn't change although it, 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 we should note that in this market the transaction price will be different than the list price and so it's not even clear what the list price you know there should be a model for list price that we don't have here so it's possible that people bargain so the real transaction price is uh, slightly different, so you don't. Have Wait, what do you use in your regression? Uh, list price or transaction? List price. It's the price on the uh, on their website. You don't. You, you don't observe transaction price. Is that it? We, so, we actually do in another data. Um, we we merged the data with transaction prices to this. Um, yeah. Oh, the issue with transaction prices is you only see them at one point, and so um, I mean. There's other things you can do to use that data, but we've chosen here to use the, the list prices instead. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Uh, so we had we had a quick. We have time for one more quick question. We had from a, a you. You, I, I am muted, or I allowed you to talk. So feel free to ask. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Very interesting paper. I just have a quick question. How big a price dispersion as a model can generate? Can it match what's observed in the data? Maybe you have a done this. But I'm just curious. 
So you, so one answer I can give you is that you can see uh, every inventory unit of the inventory change gonna change the price on average for twenty dollars, and then if you look at the variance, intertemporal variance of uh, inventory, it's about fifteen. Yeah, that's. That's in the data. I mean, when you put it into the model, can the model generate that? The, so we try to do some quantitative exercise, but eventually, mm -hmm. because this model, blocker recursive model, is separated in Solvo, and mm -hmm. uh, to we we realize to kill the heterogeneity, essentially we are just working on the uh, directly on the data. So we didn't we didn't do that. Okay. Thanks. In general, don't you think there is going to be some shape of the matching function that allows you to rationalize the relationship between inventories and prices that you see, that regression coefficient? Uh, you would imagine. Yeah, because you must be more specific. What do you mean by matching function? Which part? The, um, you're looking at the retail side of the market. Uh-huh. So there should be a relationship between, uh, I, I should be able to, to, to choose a shape of the matching function so that uh, when I go in inventory up by one standard deviation, I'm going to lower the prices by blank. Yeah. Because that matching function controls the trade-off. Right. So are you suggesting maybe another, maybe the, it, we should so model some effort to improve the matching speed instead of only letting the dealer to choosing the price? No, no, no. I think you're doing right. I do think you're doing the right thing. I just want curious whether the model can in fact uh, fit the data. And so my, if, my guess is yes. I don't see why not. I see, yeah. We can, we can replicate our data with the model predictions and fit that regression with the model predictions and essentially calibrate it with this matching. Point. Exactly. And you learn something about perhaps uh, the C. Yes, the we actually of did the that. Function. So, okay. Now is the economist time to answer question. Huh? Yeah, well, we, we actually did that in, a, um, in an earlier version of this model. And uh, it turned out that the earn ball matching function will fit the data the best. But at that point, we were using a different data set. Um, and we're still waiting to, do, to redo the calibration and simulation part using the new data. And also, um, in the earlier version of the model, we did get an estimation of the mismatch probability and also the C, the search cost. Oh, sorry, the uh, inventory cost. And the inventory cost turned out to be, I don't exactly remember, uh, I think. I think it's $5 per week or something like that. Yeah, it, it was comparable to the um, uh, interest interest rate. Or? $23 something. 23. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's comparable to, to the data counterpart using the earlier version of the data. I have a, another question. You may have mentioned this already. I stepped into the room to refill my coffee. But presumably in this used car market, there's a lot of trade-ins. Your model doesn't have trade-ins, but maybe, maybe you could generalize your model to people trading one used car for another. Or maybe someone will filter that out of the data. I don't know. Do you have any idea how many of these purchases are trade-ins? We, I don't think we see that in the data, right? Charlie, are you? No, we don't see that. I, I think of trading as always having the option to just send it to auction. Right. And so there's no reason why the trader needs to stay on the lot. Um, uh, yeah, and I think that's also a channel of managing their inventory. If they have uh, too much trade-ins and they will sell them. If they, if they don't have enough, they will keep, keep them. That's, I think it's also one channel of right. managing their inventory. Okay, I think we'll have to move on from that. <clears throat> uh, so now it's time for our last paper. Thank you. Uh, great, thanks, Faye.
Thanks, everyone. Um, so, Lonis, can you upload your slides? So those, we can see them, they're just not in uh, full screen. And I think you're muted also. Okay, we can see them, but you're still muted, Lonis. Can you see the screen? Yep, that looks great. And oh, we can hear good. you. Okay, so I'm still learning all these tricks. Got my green screen going here, so I'm going down a river of life. Okay, so uh, as is usual for the search papers I've done lately, this is a bricks and mortar paper, okay? So just single agent decision problem that seems like it's needed. So the uh, motivation here is very applied. It seems that the, the sequential search model is, uh, assumes an informational vacuum. And this is a problematic vacuum because the economist's reaction to that is let's just go to directed search because that's more or less the opposite uh, extreme and yet it doesn't really reflect what actually goes on so for instance consider when you do a web search it's very directed on the other hand there's a lot of randomness to it so google will try to rank things in the order that it thinks that you have in mind and in general, if you go into Amazon, you go into any of these search engines for jobs or spouses or partners or match.com or whatever, they're trying to put things in the right order. There's a directed search element to it, but they're trying to reflect, there's randomness that's, that remains. Okay, so um, here is the history of search that's relevant to understand where we're coming. Um, Economists or search theorists don't know that actually the first sequential search paper by, was by Sam Carlin. And you can trace it back further if you're interested. What's that? You can trace it back further in the literature if you're interested. Well, this would be the first sequential, sequential analysis would precede this, but essentially it was, it was kind of low hanging fruit for people who are interested in dynamic programming. Anyways, Sam, Seems like a cool decision uh, theory name for a searcher because he's search and matching Sam. So we will be calling our agent Sam. I think we should shift to doing that in the search literature out of deference to Sam Carlin's role here. Okay, but we tend to date it back to uh, McCall, 1970, wrote a very simple paper. What's the lesson? It's the lesson we get out of all sequential search models that you have to have a reservation price or a reservation wage. And if you ask, what's the predictions? Well, if I tell you that the search cost goes up, you're not gonna search as much, big deal. Um, but I ask you what happens if the distribution of prizes changes and say, what does that do? Well, if it grows riskier, you're better off. Sam is better off. But what happens to your behavior? No idea. Um, and in this informational vacuum, you're never going to recall because it's a stationary environment. Weitzman comes in, produces a very sweet model that we often will use, uh, the Pandora's box problem. And now he shows that you can construct these reservation wages that will de determine not only when to stop, but also where to search next. And he retains the lesson that McCall had that risk helps. Um, in his setting, recall also happens. He has no, his environment is way too general to say anything. He can make no behavioral predictions at all. Okay, so that's the environment that we're coming into. So we're gonna produce a very simple tractable model of ordered search, this blend between directed and sequential with the randomness there that the whole family can use. So, what it essentially is a big picture, it's just a random class of Weitzman models and their payoffs, the payoffs of every one of these 
options that you face will be the sum of two factors. One that's known a priori, this will correspond to the boxes of Pandora, and one that is hidden, the contents of the boxes. And what will happen in a search engine is that it will pre-rank them according to the known factors. It will read your cookies or whatever and determine what is best. If you were in a, in a non-web um, environment and you had to do it all on your own, you would rank them according to the known factors. And then you would go through opening up the boxes as Weissman said. Okay, so that's, that's the framework here. Um, okay, so here are the questions we want to answer. What happens over time? Weitzman was unable to say. He gave you a dynamic programming algorithm, but he couldn't make any conclusions. Next, how long does search last? Now, this is actually an interesting question because we've had McCall for 50 years and still have not answered the question of how long, what makes you search longer? which is a very strange thing to be open for half a century. Um, well, are you ignoring all the labor literature which worries about duration of unemployment? I'm not ignoring anything. I'm making a correct statement that we do not know any distributional changes before our paper that cause you to search longer. That's a fact. I don't know, I don't know the problems that are not decision theory, but I'll guarantee you that there is no answer to that question. Um, and then we've been using stationary search model. When you use a stationary search model, you say, well, yeah, it's not exactly capturing things, but it's a good benchmark. It approximates what's going on. Does it? Okay. So what happens over time in this model is that search intensifies. Sam increasingly is going to be recalling options, increasingly is going to be exploring options. Not only that, we can say which options he'll be recalling. He's going to recall the options that were long ago with a higher chance of the ones that he just, just recently explored. Next, what is the answer to this half century question? What makes you search long? And the answer is if the distribution experiences an increase in the dispersive order. Mean preserving spread was just not enough. It was just the wrong way of thinking of the problem. So uh, this works in the classic search model. And in our framework, it'll work for the hidden factors one way and for the known factors the opposite way. And then the, to the question of were we smart to use a stationary search model as a benchmark, the answer is not always. It turns out this does not, the classic search model does not approximate large finite models. You can have the number of options exploding. And in one case, we're gonna have that you're never gonna have your recall chance go to zero. So at this point, I guess I, I should stop sharing and let Michael take over. Um, stop share. Okay, Michael. Floor is yours. Are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Okay. Okay. Um, here we go. All right. Uh, you can see the slides. Uh, yeah, okay. Good. Okay. With uh, Longness Grant introduction, now I try to deliver <laughs> the model and justify the results. Uh, okay. So. The model is actually quite simple. So that's one agent in the model, Sam. He wants to exercise one option out of n plus one options. So n of these options are the inside options. So these are the Pandora boxes. And there's one outside option with known payoff. So it's like a fixed payoff. You can to explore an inside option, you need to pay an explicit search cost C, strictly positive. Uh, the search rule is quite flexible. Sam can search in any order and stop at any stage. When he stops searching, he either exercises one previously explored box. He cannot open the box. He cannot exercise a box that he never in, uh, in, uh, explored before. Or Sam can quit, namely that he can exercise the outside option. 
Uh, the net payoff, if SAM stops at stage N, for example, uh, the net payoff is simply W minus the number of box he opened times C. Uh, so implicitly, we are assuming there's no discounting in this model. The payoff of each inside option is the sum of two random components, uh, the known factor X and the hidden factor C. Uh, the known component is the component that you see prior to search. So at the beginning of Michael, the game- can I ask a question? So this yep, payoff sure. function, is it also assuming there's no sunk cost or like the player is committed to some strategy from time zero? Oh because wait, uh, so the search cost is sunk. So once you open a box, oh. you have to pay the sunk cost, you have to pay the cost C anyway. So and here is just the number of box that you explore when you choose to stop searching. So you can think of each of the search cost C is sunk once you open the box. I see. So it's there. <laughs> There's no commitment in that sense. I see. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, the known factor is the pre-search information that you get before you start searching. C is the information that you discover for each box when you open it. Uh, so we assume that the known and hidden factor are jointly independent. There are two assumptions here. So first we assume the known and hidden factor are independent for each box. This this assumption is actually not super difficult to relax if you want to. The hard one is we assume all the boxes are independent. Uh, that means there's no learning. If you open one box, you don't learn something else about other boxes. Uh, okay. We assume the known and hidden factor have uh, CDF, G and H respectively. They both have log concave density. Turns out log concavity is very important in this model. Uh, I'll get to that when we get to the result, the role of log concavity. So again, uh, in the beginning of the game, the uh, Sam will see all the X's realized. And in this case, because all the hidden factors have the same distribution, so the reasonable thing you would expect Sam to do is to rank order the known factors in descending order. So you should expect Sam to explore the box with the highest known factor first, and then the second highest factor. So these X's are actually the order statistic of the known factors. Uh, so one more thing before we move on. So for this payoff structure where W is the sum of X and C, you can think of X and C as two sets of characteristics of the box so that they're additively separable. And alternative interpretation is to think of a Bayesian learning story Right before you start searching, you get a signal from each of the box. After you get a signal, you update your posterior and X will be the expected value of the box after you update your belief. So it's like once you enter a keyword in search engine, the search engine is to give you some information about each website that's embedded in X. So that's the model. Okay, very simple. I have a question. Yep. So this, this log concavity assumption is used all over the place in search theory. You know, I mean, there are lots of people who thought about how changes in the wage distribution affect the duration of unemployment. And for standard changes like a, uh, a translation of the distribution or portion. Yeah, yeah, increase, yeah, you're absolutely right. Do the comparative statics, if log concavity holds, are you using it for the same purpose? Yeah, very similar. Yeah, very similar to what we do in a uh, standard search model. Here we are exploring the role of log concavity in non-stationary search. So um, I, I agree, log concavity gives us a lot of regularity in search behavior. So here the difference is that we're looking at it outside of the stationary world. What does log concavity give us in that kind of world? It won't be needed for the duration uh, compared to static though. Yeah, we'll get there, we'll get there. I'll tell you where. We have a few quick clarification questions that are coming in the, the q and I'll just, I'll just go ahead and ask them. It's about when are things known? So the known factor is known at the beginning of time, say across all options that's observable Correct. for all these signals. And then is the distribution H known? Yes, G that's and H known. are both known. Okay. Thanks. Okay, thank you for the questions. Okay, with your permission, I will move on. Um, so optimal stopping is actually straightforward in this model. We almost immediately just apply Weissman's result. Um, so the stopping rule here will be a reservation rule. 
So this W bar N will be the reservation utilities for each of the option. Uh, because the payoff is additive separable, it's W equal to X plus C. So the cutoff are also additive separable. So each for the stage N cutoff is the sum of the stage N non component plus an optionality term theta. Theta is very easy to compute. You just use the standard, well, some people call it the McCoy equation, which says you're indifferent between accepting theta right away or you're willing to pay a search cost C to explore one more option. And then you get the optionality of choosing the max between the next box and theta. So it's the standard indifference condition that we have in search theory. Or you can rewrite this with integration by Park standard procedure. You can solve theta with this integral. Uh, so Weisman showed that the cutoff for exploring box N is simply Xn plus theta. Uh, so with that, the search order is obvious. You just explore the boxes in descending order of Wn. And you stop if the best so far option that you encounter so that will include everything that you explore so far and the outside option. If any one of those things exceed the value of the next cutoff, then you stop and exercise the best so far box. So that's the stopping rule. Uh, just to make the idea concrete, let's look at a very simple two option, two boxes example. So if you have two boxes, because we rank order the known factors, you will always explore X1 for, uh, box one first. Okay, that's just normalization. So in one case, you could visit box one first, okay? And then you find out the realized value of C1. And then you compare that with the cutoff of visiting box two. If it exists, the cutoff, then you stop. In this case, we call you strike box one. You exercise it immediately. Uh, a second example is you visit one first. Well, but turns out it's not good enough to make you stop. So you explore box two. And at the end, you compare the realized value of box one and box two payoff, you find out one is still better. In this case, you recall box one. That's how recall happened in this model. Uh, the last case is straightforward. You explore both boxes and then you exercise box two right away. Uh, I see a question. From Faye? No? Okay, no. So that's how the model works. Michael, you do have a few more questions in the Q&A. Oh, okay. Just read them to you quickly, given that you're, you're doing good on time. Uh, I can, I need to see the questions. Here, I, I can read them to you. So Nikita asks, do you have a sense of how difficult it is to introduce learning about the distribution uh, of X and Z? Uh, so, okay. Okay, so learning, if the, let's say the hidden factors are correlated across boxes, then you will have learning. You open one box, you learn something about the distribution of other boxes. Uh, that problem is actually known to be super hard if you want to solve it in general. Uh, there's some specific distribution that people use sometimes to get tractability. For example, Gaussian distribution. I think um, Ken Burden co-author has a paper related to it, but not exactly, this, not exactly in this way. I think most of the learning paper out there are doing random search. You open the boxes, you learn the about the distribution, but you don't get to choose the order you explore the boxes. The general problem of optimal sequential search with learning is still an open question. I don't think it's done at all. Well, we have yeah. learning about the realizations though, and that's- Yeah, okay. Kind of yeah, okay, learning about. in different senses. But I thought the question is about learning across boxes, so maybe I misunderstood. If that's right. Pointed, if you were watching someone play this box, you would think he's learning. Of course, he can see ahead these known factors. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, search is learning, right? By definition, almost. Yes. Okay. So, did I answer all the questions? Or are there more? One, one more quick question. So, so why is it important to to model the known factor as being a, a random variable as opposed to just some exogenous constants across boxes? Um. Okay. There's several answers to that. Uh, one is, we think it's the easiest way to put structure to the model. As long as mentioned earlier, if you just let this known factor to be completely arbitrary, completely arbitrary realization, it's actually impossible to get behavioral prediction because you get um, all kinds of things will be going. Uh, so that's one answer to it. And then um, we want to, ex in one of the extension that 
I might or might not have time to talk about. Uh, having the known and hidden factor both being random variable has the advantage of we can change the variance of the two random variables. So one of the applications will reduce the variance of the hidden factor and increase the variance of the known factor. In this case, we try to capture the idea that the search engine is being more and more accurate in, the, in being able to release more information prior to search. So having two random variables will give us that nice notion of search accuracy. Okay. That's right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, now we get to the part where we try to explore the behavioral bit of the model. That's the key of the paper. Uh, so first, some definitions. We define all these stopping chances. So SN is the chance that you stop at stage N. RN is the chance that you recall an uh, earlier option at stage N. K is the chance you strike an option. That means you exercise the stage N option. Uh, Q is the chance that you quit and exercise the outside option at stage N. So we're going to characterize how these uh, conditional probabilities evolve over time. And we are computing these probabilities from an ex-ante perspective. So we are imagining we are the outsider or the modeler of this world. And then without knowing the known factor, we try to compute this conditional probability. So they're unconditional on the realization of X. Uh, so as you search more and more, the main economic forces are two effects. That's first a direct effect. As you explore more and more options, naturally you have more and more things to recall. So you build up your fallback option. And then the future get worse and worse because you're doing non-stationary search. So the remaining boxes are quite bad. So the direct effect will actually make you stop earlier. Okay, so that's just natural. Uh, but also there's a selection effect going on because if you're willing to search for a long time, that usually implies that your fallback option that you discover so far is pretty bad. Otherwise, you wouldn't be willing to search for a long time. So the selection effect actually suggests the opposite. The longer that you search, the worse must be your fallback option. So you should be looking for things for even longer time. Okay. So in this world, um, when we try to characterize the behavior, one of the uh, challenges to try to make sure one of the effect dominate or not. Otherwise, things would just be completely non-monotone. We cannot say much about things. So here, this is the role of log concavity. So log concavity actually gives us uh, um, a lot of regu you, regularity. Sorry. Can I ask you to clarify, please? So these three, these four events, are they nested in some way? Like yes, the they're, not, they're not completely one? exclusive. You're right. All four exclusive. So what does stop mean? Uh, no, so they're not exclusive. Uh, stop means Okay, stop includes everything that you can do in terms of exercising options. So stop will include recall or strike or quit. So stop will include the other three events. Thank you. Yep, yep. So, so yeah, I should have ex mentioned it. We think these are important properties, but they're not necessarily exclusive. Yep. Yeah, you could mention that this is, I mentioned earlier in the labor stuff. I mean, it's quite related, right? The standard result is if you, change the wage offer distribution at a given reservation, change it for the better, for a given reservation wage, you won't search as long. Within the reservation wage it goes up, so it's like your two effects. And log concavity guarantees the second effect is not bigger than the first. Yeah, yeah, you're exactly right. Yep, yep. Uh, okay, so, right, okay, so like Randy mentioned, so log concavity guarantee the direct effect dominates. Uh, I mean, the proofs are not exactly the same as the standard model, but it's similar, it's related. It's just much harder somehow. Um, so if you have log concavity for these distributions, uh, we show that search intensifies, namely that search, uh, Sam is more likely to stop at any stage, more likely to recall an option, more likely to exercise an option. So sum of recall and striking chance, the chance of exercising any inside option. These things all increase in N. Uh, the critting chance somehow is not necessarily monotone because as you explore more and more options, uh, of course, you're more likely to stop. So in that sense, you're more likely to quit, but at the same time, you're building up more inside option to recall. So you have more things to choose from. So you are not necessarily exercising your outside option. You might just pick one of the previously explored inside option. So the critting chance is not monotone, uh, but we, have a condition, the guarantee is, that's when search cost is small. Um, 
So that's one side of it. Uh, when we explore this model, we pay a lot of attention to recall because this is the new bit of non-stationary search. So we also try to look at which option you will exercise so, uh, given that you are going to recall, okay? Uh, so it turns out it also depends on log concavity. If the distribution of the hidden factor is log concave, which is our main assumption in the model, you're going to explore, uh, you can exercise the older option, like the earlier option more often, okay, with higher chance. Uh, if the distribution is log convex, you actually get the opposite. You recall recent options more often. So uh, some people will say in this class of model, some people will say, uh, to explain recall, we need some behavioral assumptions because people have limited memory and recall is costly, things like that. And they tend to think that uh, this kind of model will predict your recall recent option more often. Uh, so in our world, you actually don't need any of these behavioral assumptions. All you need to do is to make the right assumption about H, then you can generate both kinds of behavior. You can recall earlier option more often or later options more often. Okay. Uh, again, the main idea here is log concave distribution. When you truncate it, it behaves very nicely. The distribution doesn't move dramatically when you truncate it, uh, when you truncate away the lower tail. For log convex distribution, if you truncate the lower tail, the distribution, the one you truncate can change dramatically. The mean can increase by a lot. So that's the main reason you get the opposite predictions. Okay. And that doesn't depend on the other distribution. This is only dependent on age oh. or which one of them, the known factor distribution? Uh, for this result, it doesn't. Yeah, for the previous result, I actually need both of them to be log on K. For the, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, now next, the uh, uh, second question that Lawrence mentioned, how long does search last? Um, of course, there's a huge literature in, uh, in labor search to talk about unemployment duration. Um, here, we actually refer back to that literature, okay? Uh, long time ago, Mortensen already pointed out that in general, if you have a mean preserving spread of the wage distribution, it's good for the searcher. So payoff wise, it goes up for the searcher. But the behavioral aspect is ambiguous. You cannot really predict uh, the searcher will spend more time or less time searching. Uh, so that's a well-known open question, actually. Now, uh, it's easy to see why there's ambiguity. So if you take a standard stationary search model and the blue line is the wage density, then you solve for the corresponding uh, reservation wage, the shaded area will be the chance that you stop searching. Okay, so that's the standard notion. Now, if you make the distribution more risky, something like that, like the red line, now, uh, the cutoff goes up, that's the standard result, the searcher is better off, uh, but there are also more probability mass in the right tail. So a priori, it's not obvious whether the size of the shaded area goes up or not. Um, so that's the reason why it's not easy to, ge to generate prediction. Now, uh, we take this question, we try to dig a little bit deeper to understand what exactly is the problem. And we find the following. If you take a wage distribution, like the, original, like the, picture, the blue line here, and do a mean preserving spread, uh, there are two possible ways, I mean, there are many ways. Here are two examples of mean preserving spread. You can have the top panel here where the distribution is more spread out, okay? Or you can have the bottom panel where the distribution also is more spread out. So there are more probability mass away from the mean, but these probability mass actually lump together at the two tail, okay? So the mean preserving spread is a local poverty. It just say that the probability mass have to move further away from the mean, but it doesn't guarantee that these mass will move further away from each other. And this is exactly the problem because in the bottom picture here, the searcher actually have less incentive to search because now the variation in outcome is actually smaller. You actually only have the high or low outcome. So you actually have less incentive to search. So we think this is exactly the problem of mean preserving spread. If you generate the top, uh, top panel here, the searcher will search longer, but the bottom panel, you get the opposite. You have less incentive to search. So that's why we think means mean preserving spread fails. Now, in light of that, what we really want to do is to rule out the second case. 
and then keep the first one. So what we do is to introduce a statistical uh, stochastic order that's called the uh, dispersive order. So the dispersive order is defined as uh, every pair of quantile for the distribution goes further away from each other. So this is a global condition because it imposes that any pair of quantile, not just one, not just the mean, right? Any pair will have to be wider. Uh, mathematically, it's equivalent to saying that the inverse CDF or the quantile function goes deeper. That's what dispersive order means. So you can imagine the CDF is flatter. That's something like that. Uh, the dispersive order only measure the variation of the distribution is location free. But if you keep the mean unchanged, so you do a mean preserving dispersion, then you will get a space, you will have mean preserving, mean preserving spread. So mean preserving dispersion is a special case of mean preserving spread. By the uh, way, Michael is concealing the genius proof that he has of this, where he rewrites the expected payoff in terms of a variable, which is the hazard rate of stopping. You've got to see it. It is kind of the way the search theorists should have been looking at this all the time. Yeah, okay. I'll Okay, I'll get to that. Okay. Oh, really? I don't no, see I, it I ahead of the slides, yeah, so I'm, I'm advertising that. something that you have yeah, not yeah. advertised and will yeah, not Yeah, I thought there's no time for that. Okay, so okay, so that's a uh, very neat proof that we can rewrite the standard McCoy equation in a way to prove this result. The dispersive order just works. Uh, we also proved the exact same result with a graphical proof as well. It's also super neat. You just look at some pictures. It just worked magically. Uh, it's in the paper as well. So that's some advertisement. Um, here, I just provide the intuition. So if you apply the dispersive order, that's exactly what we want. You rule out the, the rear case and you keep the one that you want. All the probability mass are more spread out across the distribution. Um, that will give us what we wanted. If the distribution is more dispersed, uh, I, I mean, the hidden factor is more dispersed, then uh, the person search longer in the sense that if we let this sigma n to be the survival chance, that is the chance that you search at least for n stages, then all these survival chance will go up as the distribution goes more dispersed. Okay. Uh, so in this sense, we think we kind of speak to the open question of what distributional change would make search last longer. Uh, it turns out that dispersive order is also useful if you want to talk about the known factor. So not the hidden, the known factor. Turns out if the known factor goes more dispersed, what it says is that every pair of all the statistics will go further away from each other. So the different distance between the second and second, first and second order, second and third order, so on and so forth, they all go further apart. That means the problem become even more non-stationary. The options are going to drop faster over time as you search more and more. So if the known factor go more dispersed, there's a clear economic force that search is going to be shorter you stop earlier because the future become worse and worse very quickly. Uh, so we have that result. The, if the known factor is more dispersed, then you stop earlier, so sigma force. Uh, but we also require, so there's also a claim that here we require x to fall stochastically. So the entire x distribution become worse. We need this because we want to make sure the outside option is not getting any better relative to the inside options. Uh, but that's kind of a detail compared to the gap of the order statistics. Uh, Michael, can I ask a question about the previous theorem? Sure, so sure. Just to understand the statement. So this is the previous one, oh, which okay. is the central one. So this is saying for every distribution H, uh, MPD is sufficient for expected duration. Correct. To go up. Is that uh, some necessity, meaning if that fails, you can find a distribution such that then doing mean preserving spread, which is not an MPD, would not raise an expected search duration. So is that necessary in that sense or not? Uh, no, it's not necessary. Yeah, okay, it's not then this sense. is just a strengthening of, MP of MPS. So I understand it's useful, but how useful is this? I mean, there may be other conditions which are weaker and they give the same result, right? So well, I'm not following uh, it. Just a, so MPS is this, is this the weakest? The strength. This is a strengthening of MPS. That's what he said, right? No, it's not. Because yes, it that case. the mean constant, this doesn't. No, 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 no. Okay. Um, this is a special case of MPS. 
But that's, that's the same meaning, I guess, what we're saying, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. On that. A special yep. case, right? Yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, you're right that this is not a necessary condition. There are other ways to change the model, the distribution that you might search longer. Right. So I think the question, sh the general question should be, what's the, the weakest possible condition, the weakest possible change that will give you the result given any distribution? And ah, okay. it's somewhere between MPD and MPS, I guess, but because we know I MPS see. fails, MPD works. Uh, but I then see. the question is, is very strong, you know? No, okay. this, I mean, you could pose that question to Topkis. You'd say, well, you found that, that uh, supermodularity works, but what's the weakest? No, what you don't want, you don't want the weakest. You want the one that is the robustly true one. No, no robustly. Weak, weakest means robustly for any distribution. That's what I mean. Yeah, okay. I so, mean, MPS uh, work, obviously, MPS works in some cases, uh, but not always. That's why you want to discard it. So it's I can be right. tough to find a minimal condition, I think. Just no, I know, that. but it's, the question is how strong, you know. Yeah, no, of yeah, course, okay. you're right. It would be so, nicer yeah. to find necessary and sufficient conditions. Right, so that... The, you but know, for so, example, log concavity rules out any discrete distribution. So you have pretty strong restrictions. No, 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 no. Uh, I guess we could learn something from... Here. This result does not need log concavity. Okay. Yeah. So one thing, okay. Um, now is what would be a necessary condition? We don't have the answer, but one conjecture I have is the dispersive order might be the necessary condition if you allow me to change the search cause and other parameters. So yeah, that's... yeah it could, I haven't proved it, but it seems like if, I'm allow, if you allow me to change um, the search cause and other parameters, I might be always, if the distribution is not more dispersed, I will always be able to find some parameter value such that duration will go in the wrong direction. So in that sense, the dispersive order might be necessary, but that's not a result that we have at the moment. But this is the answer. If someone asks you, what makes you search longer? The answer going forward for the next century is the dispersion order, guaranteed. <laughs> century, okay. Well, yeah. it's already gone a half a century with no answer, so this isn't. All Maybe right, people all right. doing search are not smart, but. Well, I won't, I won't say that. Okay, uh, let's move on. <laughs> okay, so I have one more thing to say. Uh, so finally, we want to explore the limit that Lawrence has mentioned earlier. That is, if you allow the number of options to explode, do we converge to the stationary model or not? So in other words, is the stationary model a good benchmark or not? Uh, so if we are in a world where the known factor degenerate, so there's no research information. Then the answer is obvious. Because it's almost the same as stationary model, you increase the number of options, it's automatically the stationary search. Uh, so here, the non-trivial part is when x is non-zero, okay, and you increase the number of options, then you ask, what happened? Uh, so the first observation is, in general, before you hit the limit, just a finite number of options. Let's look at the effect of it. So it turns out in non stationary model, that means in our model, you always tend to stop earlier compared to the stationary model because the risk Did someone get new? Michael, you froze. You, My, yep. you froze. So just, just repeat like the last 20 seconds what you said. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. I will start again. Uh, so, in the non stationary world, in our world, search tend to end earlier because the future gets worse very quickly compared to the stationary world. So, uh, it, and now if you increase the number of options in our world, there's a sense in which our model gradually converge or get closer to the stationary world in the following sense. Uh, as the number of options increase, the quitting chance goes down. So you're not going to get discouraged and ex exercise the outside option. You recall less often, okay? And you strike the uh, current option with a lower chance as well. All these are going in the direction that our model is moving closer to the stationary model because you are more willing to search longer. Uh, in particular, there are two effects as you increase this number of, number of options. First, the known factor increased in the first order sense, okay? Because you have more options now, the order statistic naturally goes up. Uh, so you are less likely to quit, that's easy. Also, if you increase the number of options, it turns out the gap between the order statistic are going to be narrower. So these are random variable, but they're gonna 
be narrower in the stochastic sense. Uh, so the often is going to fall slower over time. So you search longer. The second point here actually, again, depends on log concavity. If you have log convex distribution, you get the opposite. The, uh, the order statistic gap will be wider as you increase the number of options. So here's an, this is another important. So this is different from standard search model. We don't have it. Only in the it matters. So I get a, a quick question. Is the support of this axis bounded? I think it, uh, in, it matters. Yeah, for, okay. Right? Uh, so in our world, it's unbounded. Uh, so is it unbounded or bounded? Unbounded in our okay. world. Okay. I, I mean, if it was bounded, I guess, after you have a million n, capital N equal a million, you basically cover the interval. And an additional, right. yeah. an additional draw will probably not do anything exactly compared to the search cost, which is fixed. So yeah, I suspect right. so at some point it would stop. You know, an extra n would not do anything if it was bounded. I think. Something like that. Yeah, you're right. So if it has a uniform distribution, then it converges to a stationary model for the reason you just mentioned. Um, but in finite, I mean, something will happen at finite. I'm saying this big N with unbounded means you increase N, there's a chance you're going to draw a bigger, bigger, bigger thing. And that's why. Oh, yeah. But if the distribution the, the, is smooth, you never really draw the biggest thing. Right. Right. No, I know, but if there's a tail, it's unbound the tail, you know, the bigger end, the more, you know, uh, I, think there's a, I think there's a, you know, a bound makes a difference here. I mean, that's what I guess. Yeah, okay, the, okay. You know, the, margin, the marginal return to having one more option must be, small, you know, less than epsilon for sure at some point if it's bounded, otherwise. Yeah, that's not yeah, fair. yeah, right. That's the, yeah. That's really, okay. I'll get back to exactly that very soon. Okay. But yeah, right. Um, so Michael, you have like three minutes. Okay, okay, I have three or four more slides. Uh, so, so what exactly is the condition that we need at the limit as the number of bikes often explode? Turns out it's a thin tail condition. So it's related to what Giuseppe was saying. Uh, but ex what exactly is say is that if the distribution's tail is vanishing faster or slower than the exponential way, this is what the condition referred to. Uh, if it's exponential, this limit will exactly be a finite number. If it's faster or slower than exponential, this will be infinity or zero, this limit. So uh, if the number of options explode, then the model converges to a stationary model if and only if the known factor have a thin tail. That's the finding. Uh, so in particular, there's a statement here, but the key intuition is that uh, the order statistic gap is going to vanish at the limit if and only if G has a thin tail. That's the crucial idea of this proof. Uh, if you do, do a list of commonly used distribution, even if they're log concave, they might not have thin tail. So here, the wet ones, Gaussian and uniform, have, log con uh, have thin tail, but the other guys don't have. So it matters which distribution that you pick. Uh, for example, if you do a simulation like this, so this is the, we call, pop, we call conditional chance. If you assume the known factor have different distribution. We actually make this example such that uh, these two distributions have the same variance and the same mean, just, just different shape. Turns out the shape matter. As you increase the number of options to infinity, if the distribution is Gaussian, we call vanish, you never recall. But if it's gamma, you still recall with strictly positive chance. So the behavior hey, prediction Michael, are completely sorry, different. Can I interrupt you with yep. another question? So the, yep. your definition of thin tail is different from the standard definition of thin tail, right? Like your gumball doesn't have a thin tail. I thought gumball definitely has a thin tail, for example. Yeah, okay. So, okay, you, you have to tell me what's the standard different definition. I Google that no like one definition of fintel so we just define it ourselves there's several uh -huh. ways that people use this, is the, this is the one that works here yeah okay yeah that's the one that's relevant for our okay. application but it's definitely yeah. i'm pretty sure that according to the definitions i know there yeah your gumball is thin anyway yeah 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 so you're yeah, right there might be other definitions out there thanks uh okay i'm almost done okay so oh i'm okay um one thing I want to say before I conclude, uh, yes. So in, so this goes back to uh, one of the questions: why we assume the known and hidden factor are both random variables. So in one of the applications that I don't have time to talk about, we actually have an accuracy model. We assume the payoff of the weight uh, of the boxes is the sum of two random factors, 
and we have this scalar parameter alpha. Okay, we have this parameter in the sense that if we assume everything's Gaussian, then we can just change the value of alpha so that we can shift the variance from the hidden factor to the known factor as we increase alpha from uh, from zero to one. So in this version, if you have the limit of alpha equal to zero, it's the stationary search because the hidden factor have all the variance, the known factor has no byte. If alpha is equal to one, it's perfect sorting. You see everything at once prior to search. So the intermediate case is alpha strictly between zero and one. And in the paper, well, all the words of the working paper, we detail what happens if you increase alpha. So that is like you give more and more information to the searcher. So turns out search duration is not monotone in alpha. There are multiple effects going on. A lot of things are not monotone in alpha. But the payoff is unambiguously higher, of course, if you get more information to the searcher. Uh, OK, I should conclude. So we create a tractable, we think maybe the simplest possible non-stationary search model with two components. Uh, we characterize the chance of taking different actions over time. So we characterize the behavior, how it evolves. Uh, we think we kind of answered the well, part of the open question about search duration, we find that the dispersive order is the right notion to move on from mean preserving spread. And stationary, stationary model can be misleading, even if you allow the number of options to explode. It depends on the tail property of this distribution. So it's subtle details. Uh, finally, we think a crucial or very appealing application is to apply to web search because of the accuracy extension of the paper. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Michael and Lennis. So now we have a, a time for a few questions. Uh, you have some questions in the Q&A. Nikita, I uh, muted you if you want to ask. Um, thanks. Do you hear me? Yep. Great. So I have two questions. Uh, one Randy already answered, but I'll, I'll ask you as well. Maybe you have a different answer. Um, so does MPD increase search length in regular sequential search, like McCall? Ah. Yeah, okay, so we have, in the appendix, we answer this question. So um, turns out, if you apply the dispersive order in the McCall model, turns out the discount factor plays a role. So you still get characterization in the McCall model. If you make the distribution more dispersive, uh, turns out uh, because of the presence of discounting, turns out this, we can show that depending on the search cost, there's a cutoff value. If the search cost is big, you get one prediction. If search cost is small, you get the other prediction. So you get search last longer if search cost is uh, above certain threshold. So you get this single causing characterization. So dispersive okay. order in that world still give you characterization, but slightly different, not exactly the same because of this counting. Great. And my second yeah. question is, uh, did you do, did you look at anything about correlation between Z and X? Because I, I, I feel like it makes sense that when I'm searching, the X I'm looking at, I'm looking at it also because it's a signal about Z. So yes. did you look at that? So, okay. Um, okay, so uh, first the Reisman result applies, even if X and C within the box are correlated. No problem about that. If you see the X, you learn something about distribution of it. C, fine, no problem. You get the exact same Pandora box rule. Uh, now, all this comparative static that we do will be a lot messier if we do it that way because a lot of tractability is gone. Uh, but I suspect a lot of things can be extended to that world. So the correlation oh, between X and C are not a big deal. The hard part, again, is the correlation across boxes. That's the, the beast. Yeah, Weizmann fails if these boxes are correlated because you can't use this reservation rule anymore. Yep. Thanks. That's really interesting, by the way. Thank you. Great. Is there any other questions? OK, if not, well, let me thank uh, all the presenters and co-authors, and especially thank uh, the organizers, Philip, Guido, Giuseppe, thanks a lot. Um, and we can still kind of hang out. I'll turn off the recording now, but uh, we could all kind of hang out. If you're in the uh, audience and you want to join the discussion um, to meet yourself, just use the raise hand feature and we can promote you to panelists. But thanks, everyone. Great thank to you, see Zach. everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Should do it again. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It was great. Cheers.